start. Yeah, no worries. Hey, why would you ever want to be an archer? Well, it's a lot <laughs> of fun. <laughs> Hi, my name is Roy Canterbury. I'm going to be your host today on Archer Talk 101. And we have an archer on the line that's going to tell us why it's so much fun. Uh, Joshua, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Roy. I appreciate it. Well, tell us a little something about yourself. Introduce us to your exciting uh, uh, you. <laughs> Well, so I uh, live in central Missouri. I am a father of two, uh, married to my wife, Brianna. And archery for me has kind of been a little bit of family pastime, a little bit of uh, growing with friends. And, and, you know, in the last, I'd say, a good 10 years of my life, it's really got into the competitive space. Um, but overall, you know, it, like most people, it started with a desire to do something a little more challenging. You know, I grew up a hunter as a kid and um, got into archery when I was around 12 years old and just progressed from there. And it, it turned into not only just love for the sport, but love for chasing animals with a bow and just, uh, you know, that Zen, if you want to call it a, you know, being by yourself and being able to just shoot your bow and kind of let the world and time pass by and just, uh, find ways to enjoy it as something you can do alone and with friends. So it's, it's kind of a mixture for me. Um, but yeah, that's a baseline of who I am, I guess you could say. So what was it that got you really excited about or started in archery? So, uh, you know, growing up as a kid, we raised beagles and was real big into rabbit hunting was into, um, small game hunting, and my dad, unfortunately, uh, was a gun guy. He was not much of an archer. And I grew up in those 90s when, you know, Nashville TV and, and the Outdoor Network and all that kind of was taken off. And you see all these guys on TV that were our idols or our heroes of the day chasing animals with a bow. And it was like, well, I want to do that. I've never done that. Why can't I do that? And, at you know, I think 10 or 11 years old, um, I got really interested in the archery side of things. And I went to my dad when I was 12 and said, Hey, I, I want a bow. And he, his first comment was for what? <laughs> Cause he wasn't <laughs> into archery. And, uh, you know, it was our thing on Saturday mornings, we would get together and watch cartoons and the hunting channel, or I guess it was TNN network then that we watched, but, uh, we would sit and watch hunting shows and, I, you know, we watched these guys chase deer and I said, well, I want to do that. And you know, he just had never done archery. And, you know, my dad was born in 1936. So when he grew up, it was, you know, uh, money was different. Times were different. And, you know, his dad would give him a, a handful of 22 shells and say, here you go, go enjoy life. And he was rationed on what he could do. So the thought of having a bow and arrows and that expensive part of the hobby just never entered his mind. And I, I fell in love with it and I can remember uh, my sister worked for a boat company and they built pontoons. So they had these huge blocks of foam when they would get done building pontoons. And I asked her one day, I said, can you get me one of those blocks of foam? Like, you know, her husband had in the backyard. Well, yeah, for what? And I said, cause dad's going to get me a bow. And so I used to sit outside with no idea what I was doing, shooting fingers on a compound, just flinging arrows, hoping that I could hit this four foot by four foot block of foam. And half the time I never did. And I was chasing arrows, but <laughs> Hey, I was 12 years old. And instead of sitting in front of a video game or inside watching TV, I was outside flinging arrows and little did I know developing a, a, a passion and a habit that, you know, now 28 years later is, you know, next to my kids and my wife, it's the love of my life. Archery is what I kind of live for. It's what I enjoy doing. So that's how I got started. Yeah, that, everybody's got a different story. And it's just so interesting, you know, how how somebody would get started in it. And, you know, you, you hear stories like that all the time. It's like, hey, you, you've seen something. It's like, oh, I want to do that. And yeah, nice about yeah. archery is you can take it wherever you want. You know, you can yeah, take I mean, it. For sure. And it was one of those things that, you know, I today, you know, in the world we live in, people would think my parents were nuts. But, you know, at nine years old, I passed my hunter's education course, which was not really thought of at that point in time. You know, we're talking in the early 90s and um, I got my hunter's education course. Like I said, we raised beagles. And so I would come home after school and I would, you know, ask permission, go get a shotgun out of the case and go turn the dogs loose and 
I would go hunting that way. And, it, and then when I got into archery, you know, it became another way to get outside and another passion. And I can remember at 12 years old, like I got my first bow, I got my first tree stand and I literally put a tree stand three foot off the ground in our timber behind our house. And I would go sit out there with my bow, having no idea how to kill a deer, but I would sit there with my bow. And in my mind, I was hunting and I shot at squirrels and shot at rabbits and whatever <laughs> I could, I'm sure the occasional tree when I was bored, but you know, it, uh, it got me excited and, and it found another way for me to get outdoors and enjoy that passion. So I'm thankful that, you know, I had the ability to do that. Yeah. That, that's, that's interesting. You know, you, you shoot bows, you know, everybody thinks that you just shoot deer with it, you know, or, or, or turkeys. Uh, but there's other things you can shoot. With. I've shot squirrels with them before. And um, nice thing. When you're, now when you're all camel, you know, you're all camoed up. The squirrel can't figure out what you are. You yeah, walk yeah. almost right, right up to them and smack them. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. How many times have we been in a tree and have a squirrel walk down a limb, you know, four foot from you and sit there and stare at you? And it's like, I'm not wasting a $30 arrow on you today. But when I was a kid, I'd have flung every one I had in my quiver. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. As long as you're not shooting up in the air, then, uh, yeah. you know, chances are the arrow will go down into the ground, you know, if you're shooting oh, down. Sure. But, I just never shot at squirrels when it's up in the tree. I was, if I was up in the tree and it was lower than, you know, I've shot a couple that way, but yep. yeah, it's, you know, that that's the thing that's so nice about archery is when you're out there, you're all quiet. You're, you're just sitting there still. And uh, I've had birds land close enough. I could have kicked them. Oh and yeah. I've got some buddies mine. So they've actually landed on their shoulders thinking they were a tree, you know, just, <laughs> just land like the bird just lands on your arm and like doesn't know that you're not a tree. Yep. Yep. Oh, it's, you know, it's the, being in that moment, being out there and, you know, archery, you know, I grew up, like I said, gun hunting and stuff. So it was like, we had a couple week window to, to do something as far as deer or turkey, you know, large game, but, um, man, bow season really opened the, the door to being able to do more and be out there more. And I think that's what has kept me going as long as it has and, and loving this sport as much as I do is it's like, man, I, I'm not pigeonholed to a couple weeks a year. Now I can be out there, right. you know, 365 days, whether it's hunting or chasing frogs. I mean, all, there's all kinds of different ways you can use archery gear and enjoy it. So, but yeah, I can, I can, it's crazy how close you can get to stuff that you don't even think about. Oh yeah. And then getting so close to deer that you, you watch the, the broadhead change colors on the hide as it, as it enters the, the hide and, and. Oh Yeah. Like, you're close <laughs> when yep. you can see the hair change colors <laughs> I, I've, I've had that it's like oh cool i know exactly where it hit because i've seen the yep. the hair turn from brown to gray <laughs> yep yep yeah it, it's kind of nice you know like here in nebraska it used to be when i was growing up um rifle season was nine days like the second week in november archer yep. started september 15th and went through december 31st except the nine days of rifle uh, so you have pretty much a long time, you know, here in Nebraska, muzzleloader is a whole month of December, but you, you had all that time from middle of September. Uh, now it starts September 1st, which is almost yep. too warm here in Nebraska. But so now you have all that time and then you have a late rifle season. And then you've got uh, a few months in there when it's everything's just iced over. And there's no real season. Uh, but then April comes and turkey season for Archer opens up through through May and 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 then by that time you've got bow fishing and you could do that you know mostly early season but uh, you could do that all all year round as long as you can find where the carp are sitting um, oh yeah for sure yeah for sure yeah we uh speaking in nebraska and, and talking about how hot it is in september last year a buddy of mine and and i went up there and we hunted north central region and man, you talk about hot. We were not prepared for the heat because we thought, you know, we're almost to South Dakota. Like we looked at the weather and it was supposed to have been, you know, 60s and 70s. And then a warm front rolls in and we get up there two days prior to opening season to do some scouting. And all of a sudden the temperatures go from 30s in the mornings and 60s in the afternoons to 40s in the mornings and 90s in the afternoon. And it's like, oh my gosh. And we were hiking five, six miles from the truck, um, every day. And the first day we went out, you know, we, we had a 
two liter bladder full in our backpacks and brought an extra Gatorade and thought, man, you know, we got plenty and we knew we were doing an all day <laughs> hunt. Holy cow. The walk back, we were looking at, looking at each other. Like if we could string, you know, sweat out of our jacket or anything to where we could get water in us, get some type of liquid. We were both so <laughs> cotton mouth and you don't think about early that, you know, that time of year, because most guys go to the mountains or they go somewhere out West when it opens in September or late August and the temperatures, you know, that high up in elevation are much cooler, but you know, in Nebraska, it's like, Oh, we can go in September. It'll probably be cool. No, it was 98 degrees. And <laughs> oh, we were not prepared. We were so dehydrated when we got out of the field that day. I think we drank four or five big 32 ounce Gatorades and water and then felt like crap all night, tried to digest all that, but. <laughs> Uh, it's, you know, that's the fun part about archery, I think, is just what you said, you know, now September 1st in a lot of states, you know, even August and some there's velvet seasons, there's, um, you know, early season elk hunting, that sort of stuff. And it's like, man, you, you really sit down and look at a calendar and it's like, I got 120 plus days for the next four to five months to be able to, to hunt. And if it wasn't for archery, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have that opportunity. Right. You know, here in Nebraska, if you just uh, rifle for deer, you've got nine days in November and the other nine days in January, yep. and that's it. You've got those two seasons. And, you know, January can be, you don't know what January is going to be. Brutal. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. November can be pretty cold, but, uh, you know, January, it's it can easily be below zero. Oh, yeah. And wind blowing. Especially and, with wind chill. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Some of those wind chills will, will just knock you out oh it's and you guys have such an amazing state there i mean i've been up and hunted it um during gun season in the northwest and been there in the north central during the opening of, of archery and came back there and hunted in december and you're not kidding i mean from one end of the state the temperatures are so vastly different because as you're in the right. southeast you know it's kind of like being in missouri when you're in the southeast part but you go to the northwest and it's almost like being in the lower elevation of the mountains out west. And it can right. it can change so drastically. When we were out there in November, I think it was um, we hunted the northwest area. It was like, I don't know, 60s most of the days that we were out there. And then one night we went to bed and we were sleeping in a box trailer and the generator kicked off. And I got up to go fill it up so we could run the electric heaters and i jumped out of the trailer into eight inches of snow and they <laughs> had even talked about having snow and it was like really but yeah i i enjoy coming out there it's a lot of fun a lot of great topography to hunt but yeah there, there's anywhere from you know here on the eastern part where i'm on the eastern part in between omaha and lincoln and you know we have hills we have a lot of forests and then you get further west and you got the big plains the sand hills you know you may might be out trying to walk right through sand and and oh yeah you know hunting the muleys out there that are completely different to hunt than the white tails around here oh it's you ain't kidding and it's the topography makes it so different like you said you get through the sand hill section and you know you go from grass and just big open prairie to all of a sudden it's almost like a mountain. I mean, it looks that topography. Yeah. It may only be 4,500 or 5,000 feet in elevation, but it's crazy. And then you go to the Southern part and you get along the Platte river and it's just big cottonwood bottoms and agricultural <laughs> fields. And I mean, it's just from, like I said, one end of the state to the other, it's so drastically different. And where I live in Missouri, it's, we either have the Ozark mountains in the Southern region where it's all woods and, and maybe cattle pastures, and then you hit the Missouri River north and it turns all into agriculture with a mix of hardwoods. But, you know, we we still have some somewhat of a drastic topography change, but nothing like Nebraska's got for sure. <laughs> yeah, each state's got their their unique qualities about it. And, um, you know, everybody likes the state they're living in. Otherwise, it wouldn't live here, right? Oh, for sure. And it's, you know, when talking about the archery aspect of it, like, there's so many different styles of hunting that you can do, uh, you know, like Nebraska, for instance, you can do spot and stalk in the grasslands out in the West side or through the, the sand Hills area. You can saddle hunt or tree stand hunt and a lot of it, or, you know, you get down in the agricultural area, you can hunt field edges and crops and hunting blinds or however you want. I mean, it's just, 
you, you can travel the state with the season almost and change how you want to hunt it. Yeah, and then you have so many options too as far as, you know, what kind of bow you want. You want a long bow. Uh, yep. You want a, a recurve. Uh, you want a compound. You want a crossbow. Uh, you know, here in Nebraska now, those are all legal archery weapons. Right. You know, many years back, the crossbow was considered it during the firearm season. And only if you had a, a, a doctor's note, a physical inability to draw and hold a traditional type of bow, whether it be a long bow compound, uh, then you could use crossbow in it. But I think they finally figured out that you really don't have much of an advantage for a crossbow. In yeah. fact, you don't have to draw and hold. You can hold as long as you want because, yep. you, you know, it's mechanically held back. And, Correct. you know, there, I I don't use one. Uh, my my son's got one, but uh, uh, I just use a compound. I do have a recurve that I, I shoot for bow fishing, but it's, you know, you know, like I say I, on, on a lot of podcasts, you know, what is archery? You know, archery is a stick with a string flinging another stick. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, if it fits in that, then it's archery. <laughs> yep. And I think it's, you know, it's kind of a double-edged sword. And, you know, for the longest time, I was really myself, I wouldn't say against crossbow hunting. It was just, I saw too many negatives that could come out of it. Um, you know, thinking about, the amount of people, you know, most archers, and, and I say most, but realistically, you've got to spend a lot of time with that bow to get proficient right. with it and understand it. Whereas uh, I know a lot of guys that have switched and gals too that have switched across bows and, and I understand their purpose behind it is because they don't spend the time with their bow practicing the way that they should to be proficient. And, and in that aspect, I, you know, I think that's a good thing because, it's kind of like shooting a gun. They can go out and shoot a, a handful of bolts prior to season and know, okay, it's sighted in, it's shooting well, I can go out. And if they limit their range, it's a good thing. But, you know, I, like my mother, for instance, um, has never bow hunted a day in her life. And she came to me this year and said, I want to go hunting with you. And I want to try to draw Kansas when you go out there, but I don't want to gun hunt. I want to use a crossbow. And it's like that opened my mind to, wow, there's really other ways to get people out there that like my mother with wrist issues and everything else would never be able to shoot a standard compound or especially a longbow with the increase of pressure. Right. But uh, now I've got an opportunity with a crossbow to get her out in the field and go hunting. And she's well aware that, okay, if it's not within probably that 20 to 30 yard window that we've been practicing, um, you know, it's going to be National Geographic Day and you're just going to sit and watch the animals because that's where you're <laughs> limited to. But, you know, I used to be totally against it. But now as I've got two little ones coming up and I've got my mom wanting to hunt, it's kind of like, wow, there's there actually could be a use for them a little bit, you know, to get some people the field that maybe could or couldn't do it. Um, you know, my daughter, she's excited with the thought of, you know, watching me mom shoot a crossbow. It's like, wow, I, I'd get to go do that too. Right. And it's like, yeah, eventually. And yet, you know, she sees me shooting a standard compound or a longbow and she's like, well, I'd rather do that. And it's like, you know, whatever it takes to get them interested and get them started, you know, there's always a transition, I guess, from one to the other. But um, I guess what I'm trying to say is I've, I've relaxed my thought a little bit about, the crossbow hunting but i still believe that in most cases it should kind of be like rifle hunting or firearm hunting maybe it should have its own season and not just be open to the rest because i don't know i guess it depends on where you're from or what you believe but um, i see yeah. the benefits and the negatives to it a little bit but well you know everybody thinks you know the crossbows you know you have all this advantage well how many times can you get a second shot with a crossbow I don't know if yeah. anybody that's ever been able to get a second shot. Nope. I, nope. I, I was out and I shot one deer, turned around, drew back on another deer and shot one coming from the other direction. So yep. I shot two deer within you know, maybe a minute of each other. Yeah. And the second one didn't even know I shot the first one because it run off yep. the other direction. You can't do that crossbow. For one, you couldn't cock it quick enough and they make a whole lot more noise. Yep. You know, so, and, you know, you might have a little bit longer range you know, because you can hold it, you know, you hold it more like a rifle and you can hold it steady. And, right. you know, but 
there's not for me i don't see enough advantage for me to want to do it as long as i can still shoot my compound yeah um, you, you know what a lot of people will say you know the compound shooters say that about the crossbows well the traditional say that about the compounds because it takes you know the least amount of practice to get in archery is a crossbow right so the least amount of practice the time you know not everybody has hours every day they can practice you know and then yep. the compound shooter takes a more time and then your recurve and longbow shooters take even more practice to get good at it you know even you know you have those with sights on them and then you take the ones that have just complete bare bow and that takes even more practice with it and you know so it's just all you know for me i don't care which which one of the three styles you shoot or four styles you know i kind of yep. put longbows and, and recurves in the same category but they're actually four different styles and you know just just in the, the uh differences in compound you know when i first started got my first compound well the first compound i shot was in the 70s it was bare white tail two my brother bought i it. think everybody started with that I, I, that's pretty much all there was and then when <laughs> i bought my first bow it was uh, american challenger which eventually got bought out by high point um yeah, that was an interesting story on, on why I, I had to get rid of that bow. Uh, I was getting ready for hunting, you know, like a, a week before I'm down doing practicing, making sure the sights are in, and I'm shooting at 20 yards, and I'm adjusting the sight. I shoot some more. I shoot another round, adjust the sights. Shoot around, adjust the sights. It's nothing is staying in. So I said, okay, I'm going to go up close and see what's going on. I drew back and shot, and I'm holding the bottom half of the, the bow in my hand, and the top half come back and smack me in the chest. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it was the the bow itself. Now you won't have that problem with the new bows because they're you know they're extruded nice. aluminum. This is a poured a poured riser, and yeah. you know back when they were magnesium can, casting. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, it, it just had a defect in it, and it just finally was starting to work. And what it was doing was as it was starting to fail. It was moving, and then I'd have moved the sights, and they'd move some more. The sights eventually get broken. You know, I'm holding the bottom half of my bow in my hand, and then top top has kind of dangling down after it smacked me in the chest. <laughs> my buddy so, that actually uh, kind of got me started in the target side of things used to tell me similar horror stories of like the X bows when they were the speed demons back in the day, and he said the oh, same yeah. thing. Like he went to many 3D tournaments and be shooting with guys on a practice line and all of a sudden bows like you're talking would just come apart and they'd still have the handle in their hand but the rest <laughs> of the bow was laying behind them and all wrapped up around them and uh <laughs> thankfully most guys today will never most archers today will never experience that with the change in technology and manufacturing but yeah there's there's so much much better now and you know back back then you know we're trying to get as much speed out as I can you know, I never shot more than 70 pounds on any of my bows, but uh, some of the guys would shoot 80 pounds, 90 pounds, and we're putting overdraws on them to make them faster, get as much speed as we can. So so now you got your hand there, and your arrow is actually behind your, your hand, back or about where your wrist is, because you got such a long overdraw on it, because the yeah. right height is so long on, on some of these bows, and just to get the speed out of them and... Uh, you know, when I started doing them, I, I didn't really like the overdraws because that put that arrow way back behind your hand. They ever yep. fell off the rest. Yeah. Um, I had one guy come in when I was one of the places I was working. I think I was over at um, Bass Pro working in an archery shop over there, uh, archery department over there. And uh, that's why I always had the arrow in front. So the broadhead is in front of your your hand at all times at full draw it's in front of your hand that's how it size them and i says you know i say okay think about what happens if you're at full draw and the arrow falls off the rest somehow maybe maybe you're moving around it falls off and it sits on on your hand you know right right there at the seam you know that's where it's going to fall down and hit and it's kind of wedged in there you can't let down because it's going to put it to your hand you can't shoot because it's going to shove it through your hand and this guy walks in, has a nice little three-cornered scar right in that spot in his hand. <laughs> the arrow fell off. He didn't realize it, 
and fired it and shot it through his head. Oh. Yeah. That gives me chills just thinking about it. Uh, you got to think safety first. You know, if that yeah. arrow would have been longer, not trying to go with the overdraws. I don't know if it was on overdraw hot, didn't it? But it had to have been off an overdraw because always it's not going to fit on your hand because your draw right. link is actually supposed to be longer than that. Um, you know, you take your draw link to basically in front of your riser an inch and three quarters in front of it, and that's where your arrow should be cut, and that's basically your draw link. And by doing that, you're never going to shoot with your hand. Now, if the arrow breaks, that's a different story altogether. Um, that's, you know, we don't have that too much in carbons. Um, and we don't shoot wood out of car out of compounds um, because they won't take it. They'll snap. But yep. uh, aluminums, you can shoot those and they have a failure and then they can break because, you know, it's aluminum. As you flex it, shoot. If anybody's ever seen a, a, a high speed slow motion video of an arrow being shot, it just flexes all over the place. It's just kind of oh, flopping yeah. all over. And if you have too weak of a spine, you can snap them. That's why you can't shoot wood. I had one guy one time tell me, yeah, you can shoot wood out of a compound. Um, maybe some of the very first ones that had very little let off. <laughs> yeah. And, and and yeah, you can go ahead, dude. If you want to do it, go right ahead. No, thanks. I'm no, gonna thanks. Say, nope. You know, you can do it and take a chance of snapping that wood because how do you break a piece of wood? All of us martial arts are, you know, have done this many times. You take a, a board, a pine board, you know, about tw a one by 12 and cut it, you know, 10, 12 inches and you smack with your hand. You don't yep. hurt your hand, but the wood just breaks because it, it is the speed and the power in it. And that's what a bow does. It puts a lot of speed and power all instantly and the arrow can't keep up with it. And then they break. So, you know, the safety precaution here, never shoot wood arrows out of a compound. I don't care what they are. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I have a uh, an unfortunate horror story to the carbons breaking. Um, we were at the Missouri State ASA probably three years ago, I think it was. It might have been four, but I think it was three ago. And one of my buddies um, was shooting that weekend, and and we shot uh, different classes, but shot similar bows, similar drawings, all the rest of that. And I'd got done earlier before him, and so I'd went and put my stuff away, and then afterwards we'd all get together and talk about the day whatever well then they kind of got in this betting war and said hey you know let's let's go out here and we're all going to go to dinner and they said everybody gets one arrow closest to the middle and whoever the loser is has to buy everybody's dinner and it was like all right well let's go i <laughs> said well i'll just shoot your bow because i already put my stuff up and i'd shot his bow before and we're similar draw lengths and whatnot and so i said i'll have to shoot your release and everything because i don't have anything well earlier that day where we were shooting the tournament um it was extremely muddy and he had fallen and when he fell he had shot his two targets or shot a target whatever well he was continuing to shoot that arrow through the rest of the day well when he fell he fell on his quiver and didn't think nothing of it so oh. he had fallen on his carbon arrows and i guess one of them had uh, experienced a crack and he shot the first arrow at the target and then he handed me his bow and uh gave me one of the arrows out of his quiver well it just so happened it was the arrow that had broke and i came to full draw and the release of that arrow i had a nice big uh raspberry show up on my forearm because that arrow exploded thankfully it was had left the riser before it came into pieces but that power from the bow the power curve of the bow shattered that arrow as it left the riser into about four different pieces and it <laughs> torqued the bow in my hand and when it did it put about little bigger than a baseball size raspberry immediately in my forearm and stuck out about an inch. So I guess to your safety note about wood arrows, always make sure you flex your carbon arrows and know that your good friends didn't fall on them before you shoot them. <laughs> yeah. Because well, that could have been really bad. Now that's always kind of a good habit to get in is flex your arrows, you know, especially if you've fallen or anything like that on them, because, uh, you know, you, you want to make sure that they're safe and, you know, the, oh, yeah. the, the aluminums, you know, then, you know, you didn't quite have that much trouble, but you have them bent, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, and then once they start bending, you, you, you know, I've got a, a, two arrow straighteners that we used to use for straightening aluminum arrows. I never got one to shoot any better. 
you know, no. you, you straighten them out, get them off. No, it, it just never, never really it, did any good. But it you know, creates I, I a was, weak point in that metal somewhere. Right. And, you know, how do you break a piece of aluminum? You just keep flexing, it'll eventually break. Yep. Well, every time you shoot it, it flexes. So eventually it's going to break. Um, although some of them, you know, pretty tough. We've had some of the game getters, you know, those that don't know what a game getter is, it's aluminum arrow and they're green shaft, um, you know, and anodized green. And we've shot them so much that the tip of it is silver. We're all the oh, anodizing wow. off, you know. We wore it so, off. Yeah, we wore it all off. The tip of these game getters are, are shiny instead of being green. But yeah, I, I was at an indoor 3D tournament one time and, and I was like, seems like this i was always shooting one off you know throwing into the you know the almost eight in the fives or fives and it's so finally that's okay i'm gonna spin it so i spin it. it's like oh that's good uh that was bent <laughs> so then i put a different spot you know i've been shooting a bent arrow <laughs> yep you know and, yep. and i used to shoot the double uh, x78s um which are a one one point five thousand straightness that at that time that was the straightest aluminum you could get and yeah. you know with it being bent oh yeah it was so far it's like i'm not even anywhere close and it's ah what's going on and i found that i was like okay so then you pull the knockout so you can't shoot it yeah and the integrity yeah. of those 78s seemed to be so much stiffer than the 75s that once they got out of being straight there was no fixing them no no and I shot 2512. So that was a big, big fat yep. shaft and, you know, fairly thick and, um, you know, not super thick wall. But um, for, for those that don't know what aluminum and how they're sized, a 2512 is 25 uh, thousandths wide, makes a quarter of an inch. And the thickness is 12 thousandths of an inch thick. So you've got, you know, quarter inch by 12 thousandths wall. And you know, twenty one yes. seventeenths is a twenty one sixty four diameter and um, seventeen thousand swell thickness. So the first one number is in sixty fourths, and the second number is in thousand. So uh, if anybody says you know they're shooting twenty one seventeens or whatever, now you have an idea of what they are. Um, you can you can shoot over spined arrows. The spine chart said what I was shooting. I didn't need a twenty five twelve. But I was shooting the 25 toe is way over spine, but you know what? It shot great out of whatever bow I was shooting it out of. Yeah, you, you can, can normally over make that over spine work and make it tune a lot easier than you can the under spine. Well, under spines are dangerous. And yep. you know, a lot of people like to shoot into papers, is you know, papers, the end all on everything. It's like, no, yeah. I can take a perfectly tuned bow and shoot perfect holes. I can take that same bow and make it shoot terrible holes. Yep. Yep. Just by the way I grip it and hold it. In fact, yep. just by the way I grip it, because I don't hang on to my bow. If I don't have a sling, I, my bow drops every time if I don't have a sling. <laughs> so I don't hang on to it. <laughs> yep. Less hand torque, less less option to mess it up. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, that's it's kind of, you, you learn those things over the years. And, um, you know, in 95, I was was learning the back tension release as also being become an um, archery instructor. And so, I, you know, teaching back tension release and I'd be doing martial arts for many years and I just kind of merged the two uh, techniques in, into uh, what I think works the best for me. And yep. everybody I've taught that use that same technique has improved their skills. And, you know, one of the things I've said this on a couple of other uh, podcasts, but I used to keep a, a string because, you know, having the store, I had a big roll of loop material. You know, I didn't yep. have a little bitty cut ones. That's a great big long roll. I don't know how they've had it when I bought the store. They had it. I still got the roll. I still haven't used it up. I don't think I'll <laughs> ever use that roll up. And on there, all my strings are all made the same. So I'll, I'll put the bead on the end, put it on there. I got to mark it four and a half inches. I cut it, flare it out, burn it. That's the size of my loops. That's the size I make them all four and a half inches. And it turns out to be, you know, kind of perfect uh, size. Now, some of your jaws have real big pieces on them, and then you have to make it slightly longer because you can't get the jaw on with the knock on there. But, you know, most of your releases are, are just fine. I have a hook on mine, and I have the, you know, a handheld that works really good. But, yeah, it's uh, uh, one of those things I used to keep my 3D rig is I had a string that had a loop that fit around my thumb that was my draw length. So now I got my draw length, 
And as I'm practicing trying to shoot, if that string comes flying straight off my hand, straight to the target, my I got a good form. If it hangs up on my thumb or goes off to the side, something wrong with my form. Yep. It's the most efficient way is to go straight to your target, push to your target. And there's there's many times I took that and I'm shooting. It's like, that's hanging up. What's going on? So then I go through and everything. It's like, okay, three or four times. All right, it's worked good. And then you keep shooting good again. <laughs> you know, and it's so simple that, to... You talk about that, and it's so simple that, you know, one little misalignment of the elbow or tilt of the hand. I mean, there's so many different things that you could just easily get lazy with and not not pick it up. But having something like that, you know, you don't have to shoot the bow to figure out what you're doing wrong. Right. And I would take, you know, now when, when I first learned it in 95, it's it's a VCR. That's how yep. we recorded everything. Because your phones did not record video. Your phones were for talking, period. You know, the, and then it took me a long time before I was like, okay, I have no choice. I have to get a smartphone. I wanted a phone that made calls, yep. made call quality calls. I didn't worry about it. getting the smartphones. They're good at everything else except making calls. <laughs> I've had some of those, like, I can't make a call, phone call, but I can do all this other stuff. I'm like, yeah. I want to talk <laughs> on the phone. <laughs> now they get a little bit better. but <laughs> Yeah, and they don't come in a bag anymore. So we're yeah. light years <laughs> ahead, right? <laughs> I can remember those. My my brother had one of those bag phones <laughs> for a while. I, I uh, never did because I wasn't much into that at that time, but <laughs> the other things. But yeah, yeah, it's uh it, it's uh interesting when you start teaching people how to shoot and and you know go through this step by step process of figuring out, you know, what's the best way for them to shoot. You know, well, you I have your way of shooting. True. I have my way of shooting. We're both, I'm assuming you're using back tension release. Most yeah. top archers are. Um, the way you do your back tension may be a little bit different than the way I do mine, but it's still the same technique. And, yep. you know, I've taught hundreds of people how to shoot, you know, having having an archery store and, and then working at both Bass Pro and Cabela's. Um, you know, I've taught hundreds of people how to shoot and improve their shooting. And uh, what I found is... Um, most people shoot too long of a draw length. Yeah. I, yeah, pretty much if you haven't come to me or somebody that teaches the, the style that I teach, you teach, uh, your draw length is probably too long. And if you're using a wrist strap, you know, I, I tell people, I, I had one instructor at uh, college, found out he was a bow hunter, and I said, I'm going to give you a first lesson for free. Quit pulling the trigger. It's like, huh? <laughs> like, quit pulling the trigger. Well, how do you know I'm doing that? I just know <laughs> I'm right. 99% of the time you're pulling the trigger and, yep. <laughs> and then yeah, you know, just say, well, do this. But I, I, when I teach, I explain why I'm telling you to do it this way. Cause if you understand why the, how is easy. Yep. Yep. I think that you're, you're hundred percent correct. I mean, a lot of times it's uh, draw length is the most overlooked aspect of what's going on in archery for most archers especially beginners or or even good intermediate archers they it's all about well i don't like this release or uh, i don't like the grip on this bow i don't care which one you pick up i mean i'll be the first one to say to this day i still can't shoot a button and the reason i can't is because i've struggled with target panic for years and years and years and if you put something in my hand that i can control then my mind goes off in la la land and i punch and and can over control something but you know that draw length aspect if you get it right it doesn't matter what release you pick up it doesn't matter what bow you pick up if it's fitted to you correctly and you follow the correct process steps you're going to execute good shots and it's right. just hard for people to understand that and, and i've seen the other side too is you know everyone everyone used to take, you know, arm width or height and times 2.5 and uh, all the different equations. And it's like, so everyone's built differently. You know, our, our chest right. length is different. Our arm length is different. And it's like, you know, granted you may come very close to what that draw length needs to be, but then it's about looking at somebody and fit placement to nose, mouth, hand, jaw, all the rest of that and make minor adjustments. So it's like so many people have lived and died by, 
a specific way of finding somebody's draw length. And, you know, if I go to someone and get measured, they look at me and say, well, you're a 31 and a half inch draw. And it's like, okay, but I'm not, I'm actually 32 and a 16th if you want proper fitment. And all that depends on the length of the bow and, and the string angle and all the rest of that, because they all vary a little bit. I'm around 32 plus or minus a 16th, but if you do it just based on numbers, you know, I'm, I'm shorter than that. But if I pick up a 31 and a half inch draw, I can't even get the string to my face because the way my arms and my shoulders are built and right. it's uh, it, you're right. I mean, man, it's, it's so funny. And then I look at guys that come in and it's like, Oh, I got fitted for this. And they're, you know, short armed and narrow shouldered. And all of a sudden they are like this and they're leaning way back. And it's like, oh. you're two inches too long. Come on. What right. are you doing? <laughs> Uh, yeah it's and it's crazy because it's you know people think that you can i mean don't get me wrong technology is a great thing and there are really good sights and releases and bows and whatever else but man the number one proponent to being accurate is having proper fitment and if you right, can get people right. fitted correctly all the rest of that stuff is you know it, it makes a difference but it's minuscule it's small small little improvements versus proper fitment i believe anyway well I, I i use that that method all the time you know you measure your wingspan and then you figure that out. but that's my yep. starting point yep uh, very very seldom do i actually end up with that length um yep. majority of the time it's shorter than that yep just to get them to fit but i need to know where to start you know do i need to start at 29 do i start at 28 or or, or 30 you know you, you measured out and then uh, okay now i know where to get into you know like you i measure you out you're 31 yep. so i know i would have to get about go to 32 uh because 31 may be too short and i can adjust yep. them down and, and a lot of them don't have uh the adjustability and the old ones that they do in the new ones oh you know? for sure so like, like some yep. of some of the first matthews uh, you had a half inch change is all you had in the cam. You had to get new cams. Uh, yep. and, and then uh, some of them, when I was doing them at the same time, PSC had modules. You changed the module. So you'd have, uh, you know, a 28 inch module, a 29 or what, 29 and a half, whatever. So you'd change the modules out. Well, now a lot of them, you just rotate the module on it. You don't change them. You just rotate yeah. it and move pins. And, um, you know, that's, oh, it's... Then, then you're trying to get, you know, it's like, okay, I I need to cut this an inch, but they don't make the module that I have or they don't make the cam. <laughs> so now I need an inch shorter because I got to fit this person that just can't pull that weight or that drawing. And so, okay, put a shorter string on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yep. you can drop, you can drop your weight. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's amazing to me how much uh, the technology has changed and, you know, you talk about the cam specifics. When I started big into target archery, I was shooting spiral cams from a Hoyt and they were right. to the half inch specific. And man, you talk about a major change because then it became not only did you have to change your cam, but then you were in a different string set and cable set. And yep, it, it became, you know, everyone getting into archery now, it's so much more simplistic because whether it's the rotating mod or, um, you know, even like with Matthews's target bows now, you know, you can buy different modules for weight, different modules for length. And it's like, wow, used to, you know, it was a limb change if you wanted to go down. Now they're running right. one limb on some of these bows and you can buy a 60 pound mod all the way to a 75 pound mod. And all you're doing is increasing the flex rate of the limb. And it's like, and where we've come in 20 years or even just the last 10 years in archery is just, it's mind blowing. Yeah, I, I can remember taking uh, um, 70 pound limbs off and put 60 pound limbs on it and, and short stringing it just to get the the weight down from the shoot. Yep, yep. Well, and it's now, I mean, like, you know, with the Botex and the the diamonds that are out there, um, I just got done a, doing a deal for Bass Pro and, and um, Diamond Bows here a couple of weeks ago and was teaching their archery techs about the different models and what was coming down and it's like you know we have been for 
years, you know, the industry has been like a 10 pound variance in a bow, whether it was 60 to 70 or 50 to 60. And then, you know, now I look at some of these bows that diamonds got out that go from five to 55 pounds or seven to 70 pounds. And they start at an 18 inch draw length and go all the way to a 30 inch draw length. And it's just crazy to think that that technology in such a simplistic item, just this mechanical device is so varied now to where that eight-year-old kid that's got a 16 inch draw and can pull 10 pounds can shoot that same bow until they're a teenager and be pulling 50 to 60 pounds it's just what we had to start with versus what they have to start with now (laughs) it's it's like having the model t that you got to crank to get the vehicle to start and have a remote start i mean that's that's the only way i know to distinguish the difference (laughs) They ain't come walking up, hop in, push the button, go. You don't have to put a key oh, in them anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, I think that's one of the variances too when you talk about crossbows and, and compounds and everything else now is it's like they've they've almost got to a point now to where if you can just draw whatever back the poundage is and be comfortable, these bows are so much more efficient that they almost will shoot themselves. You get in the way more than the bow gets in right. the way i mean it's you, you think about like what you were talking about with the bear whitetail too and you know those bows back in the 70s and 80s and early 90s they had round wheels that had hardly any yeah. let off on them they had a valley that was this long in the draw lake that you had to find the same spot every time now you just draw back hit the draw stop in the wall and you just as long as you can keep it there it'll do what it needs to do and it's i think about you know the guys coming up in the seventies and eighties and early nineties that were the top level archers, they really shot the bows. The bows didn't perform for them. They actually found how to shoot that bow. Now archers today, and I'm not taking anything away from their skill today because we have some amazing archers out there today, but it's a different type of skill. Now it's, how steady can you hold? How well can you see? How much can you (laughs) build a forgiving setup? Whereas before, like it was 90% of what happened. It was the archer. I mean, the setup itself was not very forgiving. They actually had to shoot it, but yeah, they're, yeah. Some of them weren't very forgiving, but, but now that we've kind of come back around to not forgiving uh, bows, because as they're getting faster and faster and faster, you know, your form has to be better and better because, you know, I like to say the faster the bow, the quicker it magnifies your mistakes. Oh yeah, you know, the, the yeah. slower bows are a little more forgiving. You, you know, once we kind of got past that point, you know, the, the bows from you know twenty years ago, you know, they're fairly forgiving because they're not really fast. Uh, so you can make a little bit of mistake and and still be all right. But now we've got you know the real super skinny arrows with little bitty almost no fletching, and and now then you got a bow that's super fast and. And now you make a little mistake and you wonder why you're missing by four feet. You oh, know, yeah. It's yep. all because you 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 grip the bow too quick or something. Uh, um, that's why I don't grip the bow. But, uh, you know, it's, it's so much different now. And I'm still kind of old school because I started with wood arrows and feathers. Yeah. Um, because when I started, uh, compounds hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> <laughs> Because I started in the 60s. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. You it's, know, so uh, so it, it's it's come a long ways. And, you know, just in, in my lifetime from, you know, you have only recurve or longbows. That was it. And wood arrows or wood arrows. You had a couple different wood pe- species in there. But yeah. that was it. And you're doing uh, fletching with feathers. Uh, you know, then veins started coming out. But they were really hard, not flexible. So you couldn't shoot them on a recurve or a longbow because they just, just so hard. They just, oh yeah. They'd tear them off because they're just hard and brittle. And uh, now they're a lot more flexible and they've actually got some now actually designed for your, your trad bows uh, that are, yeah. they're more flexible, not really designed to be shot off of a compound. Uh, they're designed yeah. for, for that. So you can get it out away from the feathers. Uh, one thing I like about feathers, if they, you know, sometimes they'll get all kind of wrinkled up. Just take your, your tea kettle and put steam and just steam it. They steam back together. Yep. Yep. There's so many tricks and that's, you know, it's almost a lost art. The guys that grew up having to play with this stuff and figure it out. I mean, 
whether it's a vein or a feather and, and they get, you know, their memory, especially in the veins now is so good that, you know, they get laid over and they'll start to come back and guys will be like, Oh, I got to strip my veins. It's like, no, you can steam them. You can go get a boiling pot of water and pour it in a glass and let it cool down a little bit and dunk the, the vein and it'll come back or you can take a heat gun and just warm it up a little bit and it'll take back to shape. It's like, there's so many little tricks, you know, I, I shot feathers growing up. Um, cause that's what everybody had. Like you're talking about, right. that's just what everybody shot. And I mean, I shot feathers till probably the early two thousands before I stopped fletching even my hunting arrows with it. And I'd have guys all the time. Well, how do you hunt in the rain? I'm like, well, there's powder you can put on the feathers that will keep them from getting soaked. It's like, there's all kinds of little things you can do to, you know, make this work. And, and yet, you know, today we still go to big competitions, especially indoor, and you still see a lot of shooters shooting feathers. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's not going away. It's just, it's what's the new fad or the new thing that's promoted. You know, it's, it's crazy how much you can still do with archery. I mean, one of my best friends that really got me good into archery he's still playing with bows from the early nineties cause he's still a limited shooter. He shoots compound, but he shoots fingers and still shoots feathers, still does everything, still shooting off a of fish eye off of an old, um, Oh man, I'm forgetting the name of the rest now, a golden key. And it's like, oh, people yeah. look at that and think, man, that stuff's ancient. And it's like, yeah. And he's still out here shooting two ninety nines and three hundreds with fingers on an old compound <laughs> bow from 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Well, just what you said, you know, it's, it's the technique, you know, yep, it, yep. Was, it was the archer that did it. And um, yep. yeah, it's it, some of those old bows are, are just, uh, yeah, they're still kind of fun to shoot. Oh yeah. And it's, I have to say I, I've reached a point, um, you know, obviously I, I still love what I'm doing with my compounds and I, you know, still have a lot of goals moving forward in the archery world, whether it's hunting or target archery or whatever, but, um, I actually went this last week down to, uh, Nixon, Missouri and met with the guys at black widow and, uh, went and actually had a, a recurve built custom ordered to fit me. Um, and it goes back to what you said about technique and draw and all the rest of that, you know, I'd shot compounds before with fingers and I was a 31 inch draw on a, a compound with fingers. And I get down there and we start shooting a bunch of different bows and figuring out, you know, which overall length I want, what weight I want, what feels good. And he's like, so you, you came in here thinking, you know, you'd be around 31 inches on draw length. Right. I said, yep. He said, well, I haven't said anything, but I've been watching you and all of our arrows that you're shooting. We have gauge marks on to gauge people. He's like, you're only drawing 29 and a half to 30 inches on a recurve. I'm like, what? <laughs> he's like, yeah, you're, you're drawing. He's like, and, your form looks good. Your release looks good. He's like, you're hitting, you know, inside the yellow at 10 yards on all this. He goes, most people we have come in here that shoot instinctively barely hit the bail, let alone hit inside the <laughs> yellow face of a three spot. He's like, so, I, you know, we need to base whatever bow you're going to buy on a 30 inch draw. Cause after you build some muscle tension and get that feeling back and that memory back versus shooting a compound, it's like, I really don't think you'll draw over 30 inches shooting, you know, extinct instinctively. And it's crazy to think, cause it's like, wow, I'm going to be two inches shorter than what I shoot a compound. And I shoot a compound really well at that draw length. I would have never dreamed that what I would have shot fingers on a compound would be even that much shorter going to uh, an instinctive bow, but it is. You know, that, that's why, you know, fit. Yeah, yep. You know, I, I've said many times, you know, uh, a $300 bow that fits you perfectly is worth more than a thousand dollar bow that don't fit you at all. hundred percent. Cause you're, you know, it's all in form. And yep. you know, if you see me shooting, I'm shooting feathers. Yeah. I still shoot feathers. In fact, I don't know if you can see that. Oh, yeah. this is, the, oh, there we go. This is feathers. It's barred feathers. This is actually my son's arrow. And when I do the, you know, for those listening uh, I got two yellow barred feather and a, a gray barred feather on uh, a gold tip uh, traditional shaft. So it looks like wood grain, but it's not. And on all of mine, this is a reflective piece here. So when you have a light shine on it, 
it really glows. I don't know if this is going to, I don't know if it's going to show real well, get it signing on there. You can see how it, but not shining, where it kind of glows when it hits the, the light. Oh, yeah. And uh, I just have to find here. it at nighttime. Oh, yeah, at night you can find them really easy. That I found one underneath an evergreen tree one time. I signed a light. Oh, there it is. I'd have never found it otherwise because I wouldn't have climbed under the evergreen <laughs> tree to find it. Yeah. <laughs> but I know it was there. But, you know, so if you want to shoot wood arrows, you're going to have to get a carbon that looks like wood. So it looks like you're shooting wood. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And, you know, I still shoot feathers. I I got all, all kinds of them. That's, that's all I shoot still. And I, in fact, that's probably all I ever shoot because when I had my store closed my store, I got rid of all my veins. <laughs> yeah. I, I sold off all those and I sold off all the five inch feathers to um, some traditional archers. You know, they like to use the five inch feathers. I use the four. And, you know, and I said, when I had my store, I had no fletched arrows. None of mine were fletched. I only bought raw shafts. Yep. And, and they were pretty much all PSE shafts because I was a PSE dealer. And, you know, you, you pick out, you want veins or you want feathers. You want four or five inch feathers. You want uh, three or four inch veins and what colors you want. Every every set of arrows was a custom set of arrows. You know, you picked your colors. And, yep. you know, what colors do you like? Now, if you want probably the best color out on a hunting arrow, pink. Yep. Because what in the forest is pink? Nothing. Your arrows. <laughs> I noticed you I got mean, some, looks like pink arrows back there. <laughs> They're pink fletchings. Yeah, you talk about it, and everything that I shoot is pink fletchings, except for uh, I have a few of my arrows that are yellow, but those are my two colors, is either hyper yellow or pink. And you're 100% correct. I mean, there's... I've shot these in the fall and even when, you know, you're getting all those red and orange and yellow hues in the, in the woods with the falling leaves, you can still find this pink arrow a lot easier yeah. than you can anything else. Is that a four fletched? That is, I run a uh, four fletch. Uh, this is actually my 3d arrow. This is a 27 VTAC uh, 27 from victory, but I run a four fletch um, with a, about a two degree offset, two degree helical is what I put on them. Um, I don't want my, you know, when I get into fletchings, um, you know, a lot of guys have really gotten into the helical game and they try to go three, four, five, six degree helicals and put a lot of twists in that arrow. And I have found for me that, uh, and describing it to people is the faster you spin that arrow, in some cases, it will make it more accurate, but it also slows it down a, a lot faster. So with the 3D game, like trying to keep my speed up, you know, I'm shooting these. They weigh like four, almost 470, 466, I think. Um, out of my bow at 73 pounds, I'm shooting like 295, 296 for 3D. And I want to maintain as much of that speed, but yet still be stable. So that's why... You know, I don't go super heavy on the um, the helical or the offset. I don't go super heavy on um, the vein. Instead of shooting a three uh, three fletch, I shoot a four fletch and step the vein down. So I'm getting the same amount of vein uh, surface area as I would the three fletch. But that extra vein helps that arrow. Um, from what I've noticed, it helps it spin a lot quicker out of the bow. But I don't lose as much speed downrange because I don't have as much um he look on it so but yeah it's i've pretty much switched to four fletch um i shoot them on all my hunting arrows i shoot them on my 3d arrows my indoor arrows and for me it's a it's a stability and um a forgiveness factor i i have seen forgiveness out of my broadheads when i shot a fixed blade versus a um, mechanical i've seen um some stability indoors obviously i'll shoot a lot bigger vein um to get more surface contact and really slow that arrow down and, and like to your comment earlier make it a little more forgiving inside because i'm not shooting it as fast as i am outdoors um but i also don't have the i shoot a drop away so i don't really have to worry about vein contact but um with my bigger three fletch 
today with the geometry of the bows and where I find my tune with a bigger three fletch, I have to worry about cable contact because of where that flex guard on the cable sits. So yeah. I've been able to go to a little smaller vein and go to a four fletch. And I just, I seem to find what works. I can shoot them on skinny arrows all the way up to the biggest 27s. And I seem to have good, good flight out of them, good forgiveness. And I don't sacrifice a bunch of speed um, or have any contact issues, but. Yeah, I know um, when I was, uh, had my, my store, uh, PSE had done uh, a research on is straight fletch offset or helical, which one will stabilize the arrow more, you know, the more offset you put on there and more helical put on it, does it stabilize it more? And their results said, no, really straight fletch. If you put an offset or helical, it's going to stabilize it the same. But what they did find is that the more helical you have on it, more offset you have, it spun it faster. And then at the point when the uh, circular velocity exceeded the forward velocity, then they just kind of dropped, kind of like a parachute. Yeah. Because they're spinning so fast and not going forward, and they just kind of drop. So yeah. long range, the more helically you put on it, more offset, more spin you put on it, the faster it's going to drop at longer range. Where if you don't have that, yeah. a straight fletch is going to fly straighter longer because you're not spinning it, but it's not as stable. You know, that's why, you know, guns have rifle barrels because that spinning bullet is going to be more stable in the air. Same thing with an arrow. Some spin is going to stabilize it, but too much spin is going to make it drop quicker downrange. Uh, yep. They also did a test between feathers and veins, you know, because, you know, four inch feather, four inch vein. Uh, they they found that the bow shot the same, you know, same setup. Uh, they found that the feather fletched arrow initially was faster than the than the vein because it was lighter yeah. down range at some point they were the same and then further down range the vein was faster than feather because of the drag in the feather makes so, sense you know that's what they did a whole bunch of testing on and found out that you know depending on what you want to do i don't take long shots so you know, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, uh, I, I haven't taken a long shot in quite a while because, you know, 3D is where I get the longer shots in there. And hunting, I don't really take them long shots. Uh, for one, it's it's a little harder for me to see that far anymore. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can probably figure oh, out. Yeah. I, I, I started with, I started shooting bows in the 60s. So they kind of give you an idea. I was born in the <laughs> 50s. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My mom was born in 50, so I'm 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 figuring out where you're at. Yeah. Uh, halfway through the 50s. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. No, and so, that, that's it's funny because that's some of the testing that I've done on my own. And obviously it, not to any extent that you know PSE or somebody like that would have done, but those are the things that I found. I used to buy um like the quick spin flint veins yeah. and I tried those and put severe helicals on them. And, and I noticed that I would build a setup um, with just a straight fletch and, you know, my straight fletch seemed to fly with way less drop out to 50 yards than the quick spin did. And, you know, there was all with that marketing behind, you know, why you want your arrow spinning faster and stabilization and all the rest of that. And, I started noticing the more helical you put, the more offset you put, all of a sudden, like what you said, you had this major parachuting effect where it's almost like you reached, you know, and we're talking most hunters from zero to 30 or zero to 40 aren't going to see it. But when you start playing in target archery where we shot out to 50 or like at the OPA, we had shots out to 100. And it was like you start playing with these fletching setups and all of a sudden you notice that you know, that same bobble that you made on a hundred yard target where you hit two or three inches low, all of a sudden you're a foot and a half low. And it's like, right. well, I didn't feel like I made that bad of a shot. What happened? And then you start playing with the veins and the fletchings. And all of a sudden you can realize that it's, it's the drag that's created and it may be great, you know, like indoors, you know, I shoot a lot of helical on my vein because at 20 yards, it doesn't really matter. So I want the most stable arrow that I can get out of the bow at 20 yards. 
But when you go outside and all of a sudden you throw wind and angles and distance and all these things in the variation, <laughs> it's like, I want the arrow to be as stable as needed. And that's it. I don't want to sacrifice anything else once you get outside, but, and hunting is even more, you know, I got guys all the time that say, well, I screwed this broadhead on and, you know, I got this one arrow that flies great. And the next arrow, it does like this big loop and I can't figure out what, and you look at it and it's like, all right, well, you're shooting three veins. You're shooting a three vein broadhead or a three blade broadhead and nothing is lined up. So now you've got all these multiple surfaces creating different airfoils. And you're wondering why that arrow is not flying consistent as your broadhead. Well, there's not much drag on the front of that arrow with a broadhead, but you stick three blades on there that aren't lined up with your fletchings that are not, you know, cross of your fletchings. It depends. Some arrows you can find balance differently. And it's just, it, there's so many variations that get so easily overlooked because, you know, marketing says, oh, more spin will make it more stable or, you know, just as accurate as your field point, just screw it on and go shoot it. And it's like, wait a minute, <laughs> Let, let's, let's dive into this a little farther and try to understand what's going on. But, well, you know, when I, I have a three blade and three, three fletching and I line them up so that the, as you lay them, lay the broadhead down, I shoot a muzzy three blade. Uh, yep. So you put the broadhead down and the fletching lined up with them. So no matter which way you rotate them, they're lined up. That's where I start. And then um, that's on my, my PSE Carrera, which is a 2001 bow. And everybody thinks, you know, they didn't have fast bows. The Carrera was rated at 320 feet per second. That's a 2001 bow. Now what oh, are yeah. they up to? They're not much faster now. <laughs> no, no. And the ones now, that are, they're are smoother. Very hard to shoot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I try and get some massive speed out of it. Now, before I had that, before I was a PSE dealer, I had a Matthews Q2. And that one, I could line them up like I did that one, or they could be 180 degrees out. And that bow, for some reason, shot it, but it wasn't yeah. near as fast a bow as the PSE. The PSE yeah. was right at 320. That one was, I don't know, 305 or 302 or something like that. So it was quite a bit slower. And it, I could either have them in phase or 100 degree out, and it worked just fine either way. Um, yeah. and, and what I did to adjust my broadheads uh, is I put what, what they call the U-bar on it. It's a cone-shaped washer and a rubber O-ring. And then I can I can shoot it and I can tweak it a little tighter, a little tighter, and it, it'll actually move the impact of those, get that perfect alignment up for that arrow. And you know, I, I set mine up so I can shoot X's with my at 20 yards with my broadheads. Yep. You know, that that's that's my goal is to set off to do that. Um, now, they don't fly the same as field points. My hunting bow does not shoot field points anywhere close to my broadheads. It's no. off by two or three inches, but I don't care. It, when I shoot field tips out of it, they're not hitting where I'm aiming, but they're still going to group. You know, if I right. shoot two arrows at the same, they're going to they're going to group next to each other. Um, you know, I don't normally shoot single spots because I've I've stuck too many arrows together. <laughs> yeah you know it costs too much money to do that yeah it gets gets expensive it's it's kind of nice to you know get one or two you can hang up but you know when you get uh you know five or seven of them somebody i forget now and i think about seven of them i've done um i've got one left here someplace that i had uh i had two of them when i was working at cabela's <laughs> with their arrows of course <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. No, it's yeah. it's funny when you talk about, you know, the broadheads not hitting the same as your field points. And, you know, I'm a I'm kind of like a Tim Gillingham. I, I spend probably more time tuning and playing and messing around with stuff, trying to figure out why does this do this and why doesn't this do the same thing and vice versa. And I've had guys come in and, you know, shoot some broadheads and talk about that. And it's like, well, my field points hit, you know, a little bit higher than my uh broadhead does and it's like well yeah i mean you gotta you gotta put into aspect here when you add broadheads to the front now you've got multiple areas of surface to create drag so typically your broadheads are going to shoot a little bit lower and they may shoot left or right but at the end of the day we're worried about where those broadheads hit and how you want to harvest an animal right so let's get the bow to shoot those correctly and sight it incorrectly and then to your point 
so what if you're hitting the dot two inches high or low with your field points, as long as they're still consistently grouping, we care about what your broadheads are doing, not what your field points right. are doing. Well, and, but, and if you want to do that, then uh, some of your sites have a dovetail that you can slide them in, put them back in the same spot. We'll buy two yep. of them, just change the sites. Or yep. your other option is to just unbolt it and bolt the new one on when you go between the two of them. Yep. Uh, it's it's much cheaper than buying a second bow. But, you know, if yep. you've been in it very long, you know, we're going to have multiple bows. Um, oh, yeah. You, you have a bunch of them hanging up back there. Um, I've got one I hot with, a, two, a 2001 Carrera that I hot with. Uh, I've been hunting with that since I become a PSE dealer. And then I have a um, PSE Scorpion, a 2003, I think it is. Uh, that I use, you know, when I'm doing target and 3Ds and stuff like that. That's a shoot uh, field tips. And then I managed to get a, a good deal on a, a bear. I forget which model it is. If there's snow camo, when I worked at Cabela's, one of those returns that, you know, the strings yeah. are all shot. They, they return them. The string is shot and these new strings. Okay, no big deal. That's that's easy fix for me. Um, and then there was one of the dampeners, string dampeners. Uh, there, it was messed up somehow. I forget what it is now. And so I just fixed that, made new strings for it. I said, I've never set it up because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, I don't need it. You know, I, I got two bows that I have specific purpose for them. I don't need a third one. If I'm going to bow fish, I'm not going to use a compound because I can't shoot them quick enough to bow fish. Yep. That's why I use my recurve because you can draw yep. back, instinctively shoot and go. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I'm the, what's hanging by me is, is a, a little bit of what I have, sad enough. I'm you know, getting into this whole archery thing, I, I tell guys that if you want to spend money, get into archery or golf, one of the two, <laughs> whichever you decide to get into, you'll figure out how to spend money. Cause I've got a target bow set up for 3d and I've got a target bow set up specifically for indoor. And then I've got a target bow set up for field or, um, outdoor style shooting and more so, um, cause I have the ability to do so. And I don't want to change. I don't want to take my 3d bow and tear it down and rebuild it to set up to go shoot target archery or to go shoot indoor. But then you would think it would stop there. And it's like, no, now I've got a hunting bow that I tree stand hunt with. And then I've got a hunting bow set up that if I'm going to go spot and stalk and shoot longer range, then it's set up more like my target bows because of what I want to do at longer yardage. And then I've got my wife a bow and my kids a bow. And now I've got a, in you know an instinctive black widow coming and it's like yeah i need another bow like i need a hole in my head i got <laughs> plenty of them sitting around yeah we but, all kind of get that way oh yeah and then i've got a couple bows that um like the red white and blue one that's hanging behind me that was the first bow um when i started shooting for Botech that i got and i always wanted a red white and blue bow and i i originally had the white riser so i took and had it sent off and had a guy that um, custom paints Harley Davidson's and I had him paint me a uh, American flag theme to that bow. And he redid all the logos on the limbs and everything else. And it's, I guess you'd say just a, uh, a memento. It was something like when I finally made it to care enough to be a part of team Botech and, and did well enough that they, I guess, noticed me or whatever, you know, my rep noticed me that, it was my first bow with them. And so I've kind of kept it as a memento to, yeah. to that time in my life. So it gets broke out about once or twice a year and we'll shoot some indoor rounds in the basement. And I go back to shooting it and it's like, man, just two years of difference between what those bows were to what the reckonings are now. It's just unbelievable how quick technology has changed and, you know, how much we've changed as archers and, it's kind of fun to go back. I mean, occasionally I will be with my buddy who's, like I said, still got the 1990s relics that he shoots and I'll play around with one of those. And it's like, man, the archers of yesteryear really did shoot these bows because they knew how to shoot them because <laughs> you don't just pick <laughs> them up and go shoot them now. But it's fun. I, I don't know where I would be without archery. It uh, It's I've met a lot of people. I've done a lot of really cool things. Um, I mean, I've killed some amazing animals. I've, you know, last year I killed a tremendous buck out in Kansas, and it's just 
I've met a lot of people and done a lot of things, went a lot of places. And if it wasn't for archery, I mean, I played college baseball and, and, you know, played sports growing up. And it's like, I've probably met as many people and made, you know, connections through the archery space as I did working or anything else. I mean, it's just, uh, it's a really fun sport to be a part of. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, you make friends that you, you know, you'll, you'll stay in contact with a little bit more, uh, you know, friends at work or, or work friends. And as soon as you're not working there anymore, uh, lots of times you don't, you don't ever talk to them again. <laughs> you yeah. know, a few once in a while you'll talk to but you know, most people I've worked with throughout the years, I don't talk to any of them. Right. Right. You know, there, there might be a, a couple that I, I still talk to once in a while, but you know, the archers are should always there. You know, if you haven't talked to an archer in a while, you just, Hey, how you doing? <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. Well, we go to ASAs, you know, we shoot the ASA circuit and there's six tournaments a year doing that. And then Vegas and indoor and all the rest of these. And it's, you know, it's funny. We, we all joke and cut up with each other and it's like my archery family, you know, I'm, we go do things and it's like, maybe the only times of the year that we see each other is at different tournaments or different events or, you know, speaking engagements, stuff like that. And it's like, my wife will hear me on the phone with somebody and she'll say, who are you talking to? It's like, Oh, that's Aaron or Rob or this guy or that guy. And she's like, I knew is that I'm like, Oh, we shoot archery together. She's like, where are they from? Well, it's Springfield or Texas or Iowa or Montana or somewhere. And she's like, how do you know them? Like archery. That's, you need to come to some of these events and see it. It's just, you get places where, you know, like you go to an ASA event and there may be a 1500 person attendance, or it could be a 3000 person attendance. And yet, you know, there's 150 people walking around there that you all stop, talk to each other and talk about life and talk about kids and family and, you know, stuff that's going on. And it's like, if it hadn't been for archery, I wouldn't know those people. But yet when we see each other, it's like we've known each other your whole life, you know. It, it's a different it's a different aspect. You get a lot a lot of more things come out of archery than just shooting targets or killing animals, I guess. Yeah. Well, and that's why I enjoy doing this podcast so much, because you know, would we have ever met if it wasn't for the podcast? Unless it was on a range, probably not. I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, it, and you know we're we're friends on Facebook, but you know Facebook friends yeah. unless you actually know them, uh, they're they're just yeah okay I'll accept I accept it you know so you get yeah. a lot of them that way that you don't know you never talk to them and you know this is one way I get to talk to um, all the archers on my friends list. Oh yeah, you, you know yeah. uh you know I I don't I interview not just friends on Facebook I you know hey you know to be honest if you're an archer. I want you on the show. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I mean, it's wh whether you're, you're, you know, you, you, you watched, you know, like you like you the under games because, you know, that's kind of back on again now, but um, you, you watch something or like you, you watch a hunting show as archery. It's like, you know, I'd like to get into archery. Well, come on oh, the yeah. show. We'll talk about, you know, wh yep. what it takes to get started. And, and that's why I always like to take, you know, uh, towards the end, those that listen here, you know, this long, I appreciate it you know, listen to us talk. I hope you got some good information out of it. But, you know, I always like to ask before we get done, it's like, what would you tell a new archer? What would you tell an experienced archer, you know, on on what their next step might be? Oh, man, that's a loaded question. But uh, <laughs> I, I think from, from a new archer, it's find a mentor. Um, I think archery whether it's you know somebody at your local shop if it's a friend you know you know like I told my story in the beginning you know my dad was never an archer he was never really into archery um, I got him into crossbow hunting a little later in his life when he got older and couldn't um, couldn't hunt with a regular compound and so I had a friend that is still my best friend today and he's really what took me to the next level, uh, not only from a hunting aspect, I learned a ton from him hunting wise, but you know, he's the one that really helped me to understand archery. And to this day, like when there's times that I get stumped on something that I can't figure out myself, or I'm having a tuning issue, or, you know, I'm working with somebody and it's a form thing or whatever, like there's times I'll call him and bounce ideas off of him and say, you know, well, what about this? Or, you know, what did you do back in the day with this or that or whatever? And I think for new archers, that's, that's probably the biggest thing is finding a mentor 
locally that you can um, feel comfortable with? Because I think a lot of people look at archery like other sports. It's not simple. It's not picking up a pencil and writing something down on a piece of paper. You know, it's a skill that you got to develop a lot of time with. And they say, you know, that whatever you spend 10,000 hours with, you'll become a one percentile type person. And I think archery is even more than that. Like you may spend 10,000 hours doing archery and at best you'll be average. So finding somebody that will help you along that, because you're going to run into different aspects um, from form to set up to target panic, hopefully never, but it's out there. It does happen. Uh, you know, there's just a lot of things that go on that you need that person to lean on. And I think from a seasoned archer, it's, you know, find somebody that excels more than you do. And I think that's hard to do is like at home, we're all backyard warriors, right? We're all backyard professionals that can, you know, I have guys come in all the time, look at us, shoot a three spot game and go, you mean all I got to do is put an arrow in that spot every time? It's like, yeah, I do that all the time at home. And I'm like, come on, let's put that to the test. Let's <laughs> see, because I promise you, when you stand on the line, uh, you know, I'll never forget the first time I shot in Missouri's bow hunter indoor. Um, it was the first indoor tournament I'd ever shot shooting five spot blue and white face. And there must have been 150 archers on the line at one time, you know, shooting two lines, top and bottom. And I was a late res- uh, uh, sign up. So I was at the very end of that 150 <laughs> archers. And, you know, the whistle goes off and they tell you to, you know, now is your first scoring in and beep, the whistle goes off to shoot. And I come to full draw and I'll never forget. It was the first time I never shot an arrow because all 149 archers behind me shot their arrows before I could get mine off. And it was just this of all these bows behind me going off and you let down and turn around like what was that because you know you weren't used to it and and i i use that as an example because to this day now like that first scoring in that first arrow being able to have the nerves have the um, confidence in what you're doing i think for myself and others as experienced archers it's finding that person that excels so that you got somebody to chase, somebody to learn from that's above where you are so that, you know, you can continue to grow as an archer because, you know, even the Levi Morgans or the Danny McCarthy's, the guys that are at the top level today, you know, even the kid that shoots with me down here, Remington Boyer, you know, every day I watch these guys learn something new. They learn something about themselves, something about their equipment. You're never, even if you're at the top, you're still not, the best you might be the best that day you might be the best that tournament but you still have room for growth you still have something to get better at and that's what i think keeps those guys um and keeps any seasoned archer getting better is being humble enough to say there's somebody out there that can still teach me something and go find that person or go find that that level of competition that keeps you trying to get better and the beautiful thing about archery, I think, and I'll leave it at this for all archers, is that you can never beat anybody else until you can beat yourself. So you've always got somebody to compete against, and that's you, because you're always figuring out a better way to shoot, a better way to set your bow up, a better process. So until you can beat yourself today, tomorrow, there's no point in chasing somebody else, because you got to figure it out on your own and get better as as an archer. So. Well, and, you know, the goal is to put that arrow in the center of the X, you yep. know, right in the center, you know, dead center, you know, pinwheel that X. And when you can do that every time, then you could say you're the best. But if you yep. miss it one time, you're not the best because you could be better. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And, and it's a never ending learning process. Well, and and that's where a lot of people will get into uh, or a lot of people, some people anyway, uh, you make a bad shot. And that bad shot makes you make the next shot bad. And then that yep. makes the next one bad. Next thing you know, you say, like, okay, I'm doing crappy. You know, everything is like, oh man, I blew that one. Well, you just told yourself you blew that one. Ignore it. It's done. Yep. Only focus can't on get the it next back. One. You can't get it back. So 
you know, there's a lot to be said for, you know, the, the power of positive thinking. Um, you know, what you think about is what you're going to get. Um, kind of like, I like to use the analogy when you're aiming, uh, are you looking at the, where you want the arrow to go? Or are you looking at the pin? If right. you're looking at the pin, you're hitting exactly where you're aiming because you're aiming at the pin. The pin is yep. there. So where you hit, you don't know because you're only, you're aiming at the pin. So aim at your target. Where do you want it to go? If you can see the little X in the middle of the ring, then focus on that center of that X and put the pin over it. Ignore what the pin's doing because it's never going to sit still. The only way it's going to be set perfectly still is if you've got it mounted in a rigid support. Yep. It's finding what comfortable <laughs> pin movement you can relax right. with. Yep. And, and when it's, you quit watching the pin, you're going to shoot better. It's funny you say that because one of the pros that I shoot with has come in here a lot of times and he told me before we had that same exact discussion and I'd say, are you staring at your pin or are you staring at where you want to hit? Well, I'm looking at my pin and I'm putting it and I'm like, you can't. Your mind can only focus on one thing at a time. So when you focus on that pin, your mind says, oh, I put that pin over that X. But unless, like you said, it's in a vice and it doesn't move, then your brain's going pin X, pin X, pin X, pin X the whole time instead of just focusing on the X and letting that pin move around in there because it's like throwing a baseball. If I want to throw a baseball and hit you in the chest, I'm going to look at your chest and I'm going to throw that baseball because that my hand-eye coordination is going to allow that ball to come to your chest. The right. same goes for archery. If all of this is where it needs to be and you're focusing on where you want to hit, that push-pull resistance, if it's in line with the target of what you want to hit, nine times out of ten, that arrow is going to go there. But it's the split right. second that your mind goes, oh, my pin's not at that X, and you look – that much you know a, a minute off to the edge and all of a sudden the arrow hits out of the x and you go well why well it's because you weren't focused on what you want to hit your mind went to the pin when your eyes went to the pin the arrow followed your eyes so you got to right. stay consistent to what you want to hit and it's so hard for most archers in the beginning because they're not used to that you know they're used to looking at something and then in their mind you know, like throwing that baseball. They don't think about throwing that baseball to you. They just look at you and throw the ball. And in archery, they they go back to the opposite of, oh, I got to put that pin there and I got to keep that pin right. there for that arrow to go there. And it's like, no, just look there. That pin's just a secondary object that lets you know if you're close. Well, it's but, like your, your analogy, you're going to throw a baseball. I'm going to look at my hand as I'm throwing it. Yep. yep. I, where's it going to go? You don't know. You have and, no idea. <laughs> and you know what causes target panic uh, there's a whole lot but mostly it's this in my mind Fo it's... focusing on the pin yep yep you focus on the pin what, what's going on in your mind which you i don't think is you just you're just kind of jerking and yep. you're looking at the pin it crosses over the target your mind's you, you say okay Pull the trigger. So now you're pulling the trigger and the pin moves off. It says, don't shoot. Yep. It's like, shoot, don't shoot. That's what yep. target panic is. When, when all of a sudden you say, oh, don't shoot, I can't shoot. Uh, one of the things I used to do with all, all my, my students is uh, to teach them what a good release felt like and the proper way to do it. I'd have them go back to full draw and aim. I, I, you know, I'm telling them, look at, look at the target, where you want the air to go, put the pin over it. Let me know when you're doing that. And I says, okay, I want your finger off the trigger. I want you up completely off the trigger. <laughs> and I'm going to pull yep. the trigger. Nine times out of 10, they hit exactly where they want it to go. Yep. Because you can't have target panic when you don't know what's going to go off. I says, that is what the release should feel like. If you don't feel that every time it shoots, because it just it just explodes and it just surprises, it goes off. That yep. is what every release should feel like. So if you don't feel that, you did it wrong. You pulled the trigger. Yep, and I tell them it's like if you're if you quit aiming to pull the trigger, so that's the other thing I, I tell them too is like quit pulling the trigger because that's a fine motor skill. Humans can only do one at a time. Now you can do you can cycle between them fast enough that it appears that you do them. It's like one finger up, one finger out, and then and then switch. You know, you practice enough, you can kind of, but you're focusing your attention on this finger, then this finger, and 
as you're trying to pull that trigger, you have to think about the finger. While you're thinking about the finger, what you stop doing? You stopped aiming. So we're going to hit. Yep. Don't know because you, you're not you're not thinking about aiming. And and I've seen some people with the finger way up by their eye and just slam on that trigger. It's like, oh yeah. Off. And you know that's why I tell them. You know, I always teach with a, a handheld or with a, a wrist strap. You don't want, on the end like those of us that you know grew up with firearms. We put the the you know the index the the pad on on there. Well, not with a bow. You don't want to bet the set, the first joint. You want to go back to the second joint. And then you let that finger wrap around it. And now you don't pull on it. And when I first learned, the guy had a thing called can't punch with the little thing you stick on your release that you can't mm-hmm. actually pull the trigger. You have to get, do the back tension release. Uh, and so now as that finger's locked in place, you just keep pulling back and it will go off. You can use a, a, a wrist strap to do that. Um, now the higher quality ones allow you to do it. The lower quality ones, you're going to feel that trigger move. When you feel that trigger move, you stop thinking about aiming. You you start thinking, okay, I feel the trigger move. Now you're thinking about the trigger, and now you quit aiming. So that's why you need yep. to get, spend the money, buy a three hundred dollar bow, and buy a two hundred dollar release. Much yeah. money, better money spent because it's the release that's going to get it for you. Yep. Yeah, that mechanical start, device of that bow will still do whatever it was designed right. to do. That release yeah, will just make it much more functional. Right. So, you know, that's one of the things. There's all kinds of things that, you know, we go through teaching. What, you know, when you sold hundreds of bows and taught hundreds of people how to shoot, you learn all kinds of different things. No, oh, and you've yeah. seen it all. I mean, I, I see guys talk all the time. They're like, oh, you know, my pen was almost there and I just gradually push it up in there and it's like you can't be doing that because when you're gradually thinking your body is bracing for impact going as soon as it gets there i gotta go now like get it on target and just let it float around on target and once you build the proper pressure it'll go off but yeah yeah it's it's different uh it's easier to drop down to a little bit but you see some point the arm way up and draw back and drop the arm down. It's like, okay, yep. you're using the weakest part of your arm to draw that bow with it holding up. Now you're trying to pull down, which uses um, uh, the tricep over here. Not very strong. Your biceps are much stronger. But yep. I, I always taught the way I learned it and the way I teach it is before you draw, you're going to point your bow at your target. You're going to lean into the target. Yep. And now as you draw, you stand up. Otherwise, what happens if you stand up, you draw, you always lean back, you know, and now you're in a weird position. So lean forward, draw back. I always point the arrow or point my hand straight to the target. So I'm still pushing to the target as I'm drawing. Everything's in straight line with the target. And I'm focusing on where I want the arrow to go as I'm drawing, getting everything all lined up. And it, yep. it just, that's what works best for me. May or may not work best for you. It may or not work best for the listeners, but you know what? As many people I've taught uh, archery, you know, you learn to figure out how to teach somebody differently. Um, now that I spent almost 20 years teaching martial arts, so uh, they all kind of merge in together. You learn how, you know, is, this is how you do it, but they can't, they are not understanding it. Well, okay, let's move around a different way, teach something a little bit different method of doing the same thing. Yep. Same things there, because, you know, our main job in archery is store energy in the bow and aim. Yep. That's it. Well, and that's the beauty of archery, too. I mean, it's it's not different than golf or a lot of other sports. It's finding your natural tendencies and how do you take those natural tendencies in proper form to create your shot? I mean, you look at the some of the top hunters, the top archers, however you want to look at the sport. They all do it slightly different, but they also all do it the same. And that's what you got to figure out is how do you, how do you find what works for you? Whether it's like you said, coming down, coming in from the side, coming up, whatever the case may be that makes it repeatable. I mean, that is archery. It's doing the same thing a hundred times in a row and doing it the same. Right. Well, and one of the things that we used to do um, when I was in high school, I was on the rifle team. And as we're setting up, you know, like like in prone or, or kneeling or standing or whatever, um, a lot of prone too. Uh, we would breathe in, breathe out with our eyes closed 
open our eyes. If we're not on target, move your body somehow. Something's not all right. Maybe you need to slightly move your elbow, you know, a quarter inch, half inch. Maybe you need to bend your knee a little bit more uh, or move your foot. Breathe in, breathe out with your eyes closed, open them up. Once you're on target, eyes open, breathe in, breathe out, squeeze the trigger. You do yep. the same thing in archery. So you come back at full draw with your eyes closed. Now make sure there's, you know, it's safe down range, of course. Uh, draw back. You can even draw back with your eyes open and then close your eyes, relax, open your eyes. If you're not on target, that meant you when you relaxed, you moved off. You need to change something. Maybe you need to take your, your foot position, slide one forward, rely one back, turn your, your toes in or out. Um, you know, something is is different. So once you can do that, now you're relaxed when you shoot, you're gonna relax when you shoot, and you're gonna naturally go to your target. So yep. that something I kind of carry forward from you know shooting on a rifle team for three years in high school. <laughs> Well, and that's, you know, that's part of it. I tell guys all the time, like, you know, people will start talking about my peep side height or whatever else. And it's like, you know, you go back to those simple basics of close your eyes, come to full draw, get to where everything feels right and open up. If you can't see through your peep, if it's too high, it's too low or your alignment's out, it could be that you're pulling the bow too far left, which nine chances out of 10, your draw is too long and you're too far extended. I mean, right. There's all these little things that it's just crazy to think about. So simply just closing your eyes and then coming back to reality when you open them up will tell you so much about what's going on with your setup. And too many times it's, we're chasing it with, well, my stabilizer needs more weight or it needs more angle here, or I need to adjust this. Or I, when it simply comes back to the basics of your form or your setup is not correct. And if you can fix that first, all the rest of that is secondary. <laughs> I, I got a good story. It just almost perfectly fits in with that. Uh, when I was at Cabela's, this guy come in, wanted us to put a drop away rest on because he just could not group his arrows. He figured something wrong with the rest. It's hitting. He just wants to drop away on there. So I put the drop away on. And as you know, some may or may not know, to test the drop away, you have to shoot it to make sure it's working. Um, you know, because something's not set up right. Maybe it's it's not working. So I take his bow. I shoot and, you know, fortunately it was right-handed, so I didn't have to shoot left-handed, but, you know, I've done that. Um, I shoot an arrow, stick the next one in there, draw back. I'm aiming at the knock of the other one. I stuck the two arrows together. <laughs> and, and the guys in the, in the range, like, it's like, why did anybody do that? Oh, uh, yeah, I've done too many of these. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the guy comes in and says, I couldn't group. You know, I, I just couldn't group the arrows. and I looked at him and says, I just stuck two arrows together. You know, it's one of those, like, it ain't the bow, dude, it's you. <laughs> yeah. The aha you know, moment. I, I didn't tell him that, but I says, hey, let's, let's like look at your farm, you know, because there's probably something wrong with it because the bow's shooting perfectly now. <laughs> and, and so he yeah. went through the expense of buying a dropway rest, having it put on. Uh, well, then we didn't charge to install them, but he had to buy a new rest, all because it probably his form or the bow may not have been set up right. You know, so. Yeah. And I think to, you know, kind of what you said earlier, that leads into, you know, with new archers or even the uh, experienced seasoned archers, you know, finding a good coach, finding somebody reputable that um, whether you pay to have lessons or they do it because they enjoy the sport, whatever the case may be, there's a lot to be said for going to somebody that can pick apart those little intricacies of form or setup or, you know, tune you know I, I don't know how many times you know local archery shops are have great value to the archery community like we really need better shops we need more local shops we need people that can take care of archers um, whether it be a big box store whether it be a, a family-owned private place um, but not all shops are equal and i think no. you know finding somebody that isn't just pushing product for a living um, makes a difference. Cause when you can walk out of a shop and you know that they've, they've worked like you did with, you know, the setup of the bow being correct, the form, all the rest of that stuff, we're, we're creating more efficient and ethical hunters and archers, you know, whether it's right. hunting or whether it's target. Um, but we need more of that. We need those 
mentors and those um, bow techs, if you want to call them technicians, whatever, that actually care enough about the archer's end result than to just move the product. And, and I think the more that these archers that are looking to get better can find somebody reputable to whether it's them personally with their form or making sure the bow's tuned correctly or, you know, God forbid that you're actually shooting the correct spine for what your draw length and weight right. and everything else is. I mean, we just need more of that. And that will help archers that aspire to be better to go even further and do more because archery is like everything else. If you enjoy this sport, you'll spend more time doing it. Right. And, and you know, we've, we've had some shops around here that, the salesmen are on 100% commission. So, of yeah. course, they're going to be pushing the highest dollar items because their commission's larger. Yep. Yeah. Um, and the problem with those is they're going to tell you, you know, like in a stabilized, just a, as an example, you can buy, you know, when I was I had my store, you could buy a $20 stabler, stabilizer or you could buy a $50 stabilizer, $60. And, you know, of course, they would push the $60 and say, oh, this is much better. You need this one. Well, they come into my shop and I've had guys send them to me because and come to me because they knew that I wouldn't do that, even though as the owner, the more I sell, the more I make. Um, right. But I would put like on a beginner, you know, put a stabilizer. I put the cheapest stabilizer we had, you know, like the ten dollar just hunk of aluminum. Put that on there and shoot it. I go a little bit higher dollar one. Put that on there and shoot it. Feel any difference? No. Buy the cheap one. Yep. If you can't feel the difference, there is a difference, but they don't feel it yet. Yep. So why spend the extra money on a high dollar stabilizer that they don't need? Yep. And, and the same thing with bows. I, you know, back then, you know, the PSE Nova was the the big big one. It's plastic wheels, steel cables. You know, just a single string on it. The rest is just cables. And you know, I had them set up because you could get them like at Walmart and other stores like that. And I actually had one guy return it because mine was a better deal, even though he paid more. Because um, first off, if you buy it from somebody else, I'm gonna charge you 40 bucks at that time, 40 bucks just to set it up. Right. And then I'm gonna charge you hundred dollars an hour for shooting instruction. And you still gotta buy arrows, you still gotta buy tips, still gotta buy release, you know, you put straight. So all my bows, my Nova bows was set up with six arrows with tips a release now granted it was the the cheap um uh, true fire multi jaw caliper right it was sort. just yeah. at that time i was paying 11 bucks for them they sold for like 20 bucks but it came with that one um yep. and then we put string silencers on them it come with the sling and uh, a stabilizer a lot of them that the kits come with stabilizer then so you had only thing you needed to do was buy a case if you wanted one right now the cheap plano cases i didn't stock them because my wholesale price before shipping was five dollars less than Walmart was selling them for. Oh wow! So I wouldn't, I wouldn't stock them. There, there's no reason for me to stock them. If that's what you wanted, go to Walmart and buy it because it's not worth my time to take up that much space to make a buck. Uh, yep. But I, I did stock soft cases, and if you wanted, you know, some of the high dollar ones, yeah, I'd order those in for you. But um, you know, so they're all set up and come with the shooting instructions. So the guy said, "Yeah, I'm going to take it back." Because I'm going to charge you to put it together. You didn't buy that well from me. I'm going to charge yep. you to put it together. And, and then I'm also going to teach you how to shoot. And that way, nobody could price compare. Yep. But I was also providing a service that nobody else was giving them. Because most, yep. I don't think any of the shops at the time was giving away and shooting instruction free with their bows. No. And, and that's, you know, the difference in shops is you were providing a valued service that, you know, wasn't just the cost of the bow. It wasn't just what you could go buy at a Walmart. It was an advanced level opportunity to become better in archery faster because you had somebody that cared more than just moving right. the product. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and a nice, you know, for those that don't know the difference between wholesale and retail on a new bow uh, at that time was a hundred to $120. <laughs> yep. So I've got a hundred dollars. Roughly, I think the, the Nova's was like 80 or $90, something like that was, was the, the price on there. So for $90, I'm setting it up for free. I'm giving you shooting instruction. <laughs> and, yep. and, and and right there, the my whole cost 
profit in there was ate up by the services I was providing. Yep. But you know, you need new arrows. Where'd you go? You come to me. You want to upgrade yep. your site? You come to me. You want to upgrade your rest? You come to me. Uh, you want yep. a better release? You come to me because I didn't oversell you to start with. So I'm yep. making multiple sales instead of just one. You know, it's like, you know, a lot of them, they'll have, um, you know, a lot of business will have a, a loss leader. Grocery stores do a lot. Come in and get this. They don't make any money knowing you're going to buy more stuff. So yep. that's kind of the concept, except you didn't buy more stuff, you did more stuff. And oh, because yeah. I taught you how to shoot, you didn't lose many arrows. So it was the I had after one guy sale come in, service. Yeah. Uh, I had one guy buy a dozen arrows. We come back a year later. It's like, yeah, I, I probably get some more arrows. I'm I'm down one or two arrows. I forget what I'm using. He still had like 10 of his 12 arrows left a year later. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was either a really good shot or didn't shoot much. One of the two. <laughs> yeah. He, he, Hopefully well, the first durable part. And you just need them refleshed. And, and I refleshed. Yeah. And, um, you know, I used... Uh, we had a, a Joe Jan at the time, which which is basically just straight six at one time. And then I had some, I think they were BPE or some plastic jig. Like I had a dozen of those at the time. And I had eight bits and burgers that I'm flushed with. And they were during, right before hunting season, they're all going. When it's oh, coming, yeah. you know, end of the summer, I'm flushing arrows constantly. There's, there's an arrow in a jig all the time you know yep. i put the next next feather on i go home come back in the morning put the next one on let it go <laughs> and yep. you know most everything i did with fletch tight uh you know that i didn't use the ca glue it's it could be a little bit brittle when it's a flexible shaft sometimes you have trouble with them so i yep. just use fletch tight it was easier um because i'm sticking on letting them go and they're all custom made custom cut this your length um and insert it and you know, I'd, I'd buy tips and I buy tips in a bag of a hundred, you know, that way, you know, I can, yep. I went through one time and I think I've told this on one other podcast and I weighed all my aluminum arrows. So I knew weight of the arrow was already fletched. I had the weight of the insert, and, you know, I had it separate and I weighed all my tips till I found all my points. So I matched them up. So I had a dozen arrows. It was less than a half a grain difference between the highest and lowest. Basically, it's as close as you can get to being the exact same way. And I'm even taking filing the inserts down. I did it once. <laughs> yeah. And back Never then, with the way, the way manufacturing <laughs> constraints were, that was a lot of arrows and a lot of tips and a lot of inserts until you found that perfect dozen. Yeah. Well, and I made that dozen. Uh, it, what they'll do is they'll, they'll kind of match in the package of 12. So as long as you buy a mm -hmm. whole package of 12, they're fairly matched. Um, one of the things that I did in, in the, the store was uh, I would break up a dozen arrows. Some of the stores, at least you can do is a half a dozen. Uh, and then maybe I think there's another one. The only I should do is three. I'd say you one because I charge yeah. an extra dollar. So I take the price of the arrow, say like there's 120 bucks. That'd be $10 an arrow. Um, if you break up a set, I'm going to charge you an extra dollar. So I'll yep. sell you one at a time because I make 12 extra bucks. Absolutely. So I didn't care. You know, I, yep. I didn't care. You could buy, if you wanted one arrow, I'd sell you one arrow. And a lot of the shops wouldn't sell you any less than three or, or six. And I'm like, I didn't care. I'll sell you one. Yep. You'll <laughs> you know, get your you money one? back eventually. Yeah. Yeah. I'll make more money on the arrows. And, you know, they weren't that much then, but, you know, just made the math easier, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. They weren't 120 bucks a dozen. They were probably half that for a dozen shafts. And then I charged, you know, fletch them. And then um, if you want them refletched, you know, some people just like, well, the fletching's all messed up. And we got got a new arrow. No, we just refletch it. We just cut yeah. fletching off, re redo it. And you know, depending on whether you wanted veins or wanted feathers, more for feathers because they cost more. And they yep. actually took a little bit longer. <laughs> veins you could actually take, um, put the vein on, stick it on, or let it sit for a couple seconds, even with the fletch tight, and rotate it. Put the next one on, rotate it, put the next one on. So you can do it pretty quick, but you had to leave them sit there until the last one finally finally cured um, oh yeah where the ca glue go a lot quicker but i think the ca glue worked better on veins it didn't work very well on feathers mm -mm. too too porous yep and it, like you said when it got temperature change everything else it would be brittle and crack and they would fall off a lot easier and, yeah and it didn't last as long either that glue if you didn't keep it 
out of light and in cool conditions, it, it wouldn't last very long once it was open. Yeah. Yeah, it does that where the fletch type will last quite a bit longer. Yep. You know, it won't last two or three years on, you know, opened and sitting there, but no. Yeah. You know, no. I've had some as open, it's like got stuck in a container. It's like, oh, this is hard. I need to get new stuff. You know, it's just too <laughs> thick. I'm like, oh, yep. I can't glue these. I need to get a new tube. <laughs> Yeah, when he's doing a lot of wood arrows, you get the, the big uh, hot melt and glue. And I got a one pound brick of it, you know, because I was using so much of it. I got tired of the little ones and I end up closing the store before I ever used any of it. <laughs> oh, man. So I got a whole great big one pound brick of hot melt glue. <laughs> 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 oh. I, I don't know what I'll do with it. Eventually, someday I'll probably sell it to somebody that can use it. But, you know, <laughs> I'll find a wood builder somewhere that's building arrows. I'm sure they would love to have that. Yeah. Well, and, you know, you put them in aluminum, you use the hot melt glue because you can always take them back out. Right. You know, if you use the CA glue, then, you know, they're kind of hard to take them out. Or an epoxy. You know, you yeah. don't really want to use those. The hot melt glue, you just, you, you know, if you're going to do that, warm the tip up. Pull, don't heat the shaft up, but heat the tip up. And, and yep. keep pulling a couple of right out. And, and then you can adjust them. And you can always use that for tweaking your broadheads, too. Put your broadhead on there, heat it up, twist it a little bit, line it up, shoot it. Do the same thing until you get them tune that way um, but yeah it's there's so many things that you know we've done and you know you talked about uh, finding a mentor and that's one of the things i set up the arch talk 101 facebook group for is to be a source for that kind of stuff so you know if you have a question you know say you know you you have your form you're not sure what's going on upload a video if you're shooting and somebody will critique yeah. it you know, yep. I'm not the only instructor in there. You know, there's just guys like you and other instructors are in there. Uh, we've got guys that have been shooting longer than I have. And we have people in there that are only shooting, you know, just a few months or, or you know, a few years and everything in between and, and Botech's in there. You know, I've, I've been Botech. I've worked on a lot of different things. And you have to listen to one of the other ones I actually talked about setting a bow up to shoot two arrows at the same time. Oh, wow. <laughs> now that was before center shot design risers which you had to be you know, a little bit different there was stick on uh um, arrow rest but yeah. yeah i i talked about that i think it was the one before or two before something like that they were setting it up that was interesting and you know that's what the things so you go in it's like when i was at bass pro and when i was at cabela's you know we when i was at bass pro there was three other archers in there that had a lot of experience working on bows you know so between all of us in there, we probably had 40, 50 years at least of experience. Um, man, another guy. That's hard to uh, find. We both worked at shops. Uh, the other two worked at shops. So we all worked at, at a shop. So we knew what we was doing. We could work on anything. Um, the older bows kind of default to me because, yeah, it's kind of where I started, <laughs> you know, on the older bows. And so the new ones are there, guys, a take. Uh, we had, you know, archers get loyal to their tech. Oh yeah, we'd have we'd have guys come in, and um, and say, okay, I want I want John to work on my bow. Well, John's backed up for about two hours. Okay, I'll wait. Yep. You know, and it's like you know, kind of help you know, I can do a slow. I'll wait for John. Okay, because I don't yep. come in. Only want me to work on their bow. You, you know, and some of them that I used to take care of it at this this shop when they come into the new place was that you know automatically got those it's like here you yep. <laughs> you know sometimes they were a, a pain to work with and i learned how to work with them and you know we just worked good together and others just didn't know how to deal with this stuff <laughs> i figured it oh, all wow. out <laughs> you know we yep. got along just fine and and you know just one of those things that you just need to find somebody you trust and i've got uh, one guy one friend of mine that he was my, one of my shooters when i had to store um He'd work on his bow or he'd let me work on his bow. Nobody else would ever touch his bow. Nobody could touch it, me or him. And I know other archers I've talked to that they don't want to do any work on their bow. Oh, yeah. They found a tech that knows what they're doing that just takes that, did I do this right? Now they know that this tech has worked on their bow. It's set up perfectly. So it's not the bow, it's them. You know, if you yep. do everything, do the work on the bow. And they're like, okay, now you're thinking, hey, something's not right. Now you think, okay, did I set this up right or am I my form wrong? Now, 90% of the time, it's your form. Oh, yeah. Do yeah. that thing, you know, between ears, you know. 
Yeah, like you said, our, our brains only have one track that they can handle, and too many times we're, we're, we're just – we're too stuck in our ways to learn that, you know, it's either my form or it's what's going on in my head or it's what I'm looking at. I mean, there's just these little things that, you know, most people want to say, here, I got an issue with this bow or this rest isn't working or whatever, and it's like, no, if you just take a step back and look at yourself for five arrows and realize that, it's what's going on. It's the Indian. It's not the bow. It's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I've done that, you know, creating a, a, a video, you know, a shot of different stuff. And I was like, damn, my form sucks. What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, that's not what I'm teaching. It's like, then go back yeah. and it's like, oh, okay. Now I'm doing it right. Yep. You know, you go back yep. and look at your own video. Now it's, it's like instant. You can just pull it up and look at it right away. And, you know, not like when I started when, you know, the VCR cameras were, you, you, you record it, you got to go back. You can't replay it on a VCR because it's so small or there's no viewer. Yeah. You put it in the VCR tape and you go in and you can back it up <clears> forward. <throat> I had one one time you could actually do frame at a time, but you, you can't see everything. And most of the time when I'm, I was teaching, um, I just got to watch them shoot, you know, because we don't, oh, you know, yeah. like when we're, we're at the stores, we don't have really the opportunity to video them. And then play yeah. back the video. And if you do it on your phone, it's so small, it's hard to see anyway. Um, yep. So, you know, you're shooting and I'm watching one thing. I'm shooting, you know, I'm shooting. I'm maybe watching the hand, see if you're gripping. And they got to shoot a few times. Like, okay, now I got to watch the finger. What's it doing? And you just can't see them all at once because yep. we can't see multiple things at once. Yeah, and I think that's part of the beauty now. I mean, cell phones are a necessary evil in some aspects, but it's nice that now, you know, I have guys all the time. I'm like, well, just take a video of yourself, like shoot a few arrows, send me a video. Let me look at it and see what's going on to try to help you. And it, like you said, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, we wouldn't have really had the ability to do all of that and, and do it immediately. It would have been days or weeks down by the time you got the video and was able to play it on a TV and we're getting spoiled. Things are just a lot easier now than they yeah. used to be. Well, and that too, we can help, we can help more people, you know, cause they can do it yeah. right here online. And, you know, we yep. could have very easily had a, a session where I could have watched you shoot and it could have give you critique right, right here. Oh and, yeah. You know, instant feedback. And then, you know, with it being recorded, then we can always like watch that again later, you know, and, and further analyze it. And, you know, that's kind of what I, I had set up for, you know, coaching program was to here, watch these videos, record yourself shooting. And let's get on a Zoom call and and we'll talk about what's going on and we'll fix stuff. Yep. And you know yep. I've done that with with guys before and um, on a Zoom call and I've done them with just uh, over videos on Messenger. You oh know? yeah, the virtual ability right now with archery or or just life in general has gotten we're light years ahead of where we really thought we probably would be at this point in time with the stuff that we're able to do that we couldn't do 15, 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. But, well, when I grew up as a kid, we had three TV stations, black and white. Yep. And you had to get up and go change the channel, right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and you have to tweak the rabbit ears. And it's like, oh, so you're like, oh, man, it's not touch. You have to actually hold the rabbit ear sometimes. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> For you young guys, rabbit ears was uh, an antenna that sat up on top of your TV that plugged into the antenna receiver. You kind of like now you plug your cable in and it had two great big long bars that stuck up at an angle and that's why we call it rabbit ears yep it looked like rabbit ears and you had yep. to change you had to move them around to get the picture yeah i remember when my uh when my parents first got a satellite and the satellite would move and you would change channels and you'd have to wait for the satellite to spin in the backyard to pick up the next signal so you oh yeah watch a different channel <laughs> <laughs> oh man and here yeah. we are doing a voice chat and a, a zoom call to talk about archery yeah it, it just it's just so changed. much nicer and you know that's what's nice about you know what we can do and um yep you know it's it just so much easier and i enjoy helping archers out and um you know if anybody has any questions you know get a hold of me or get a hold of josh and yep. you know or, or anybody you know in the facebook group you know, the Archer Talk yep. on Facebook group. Um, join that group if you're not a member of that group. We have archers in there from all over the world. Uh, right now, we got about 750 members in there. 
um, no, no paid ads run to get people to join. It's all just, you know, people, you know, talking to them and, and joining them. Uh, yeah. There's, there's no selling in the group because I, that's not what the group's about. The group's about helping you um, ask, you know, ask that question. Um, like, like I said, the only stupid question is one you didn't ask. So yep. if you want a stupid question, don't ask it. If you want to ask it, it's not stupid because That's it's right. a question you have. Ask it and somebody will get back to you with, with an answer. And it's it's yep. not going to be one of those, well, I, I'm having trouble, you know, you know, I, I'm not grouping well. Well, the answer is not practice more. There's some, there's a reason why you're asking and, and we're going to give you a, an honest answer. Um, if you take it, you take it. If you don't, we're going to give you an honest opinion. You know, it's like, Okay, this is what you're doing wrong. This is what I see you're doing wrong. Try it and see. If it works, it works. If don't, it don't. No, yeah, and... it's all about smart practice. All right. More arrows does not necessarily make it better. You know, I always laugh when people say practice makes perfect. And it's like, no, practice makes permanent. Whatever you right. do, if you're doing it wrong, then you'll continue to do it wrong forever. It's figuring right. out what good things to do so that you can get better. And I, you know, like you said, there's no stupid question. There's no wrong question. It's just ask it open-mindedly to figure out how to get better. Yeah. If you're not open for the answer, don't ask the question. Yep. Because <laughs> yep. we're going to be honest. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, you'd be much better off to go out and shoot five arrows and quit than to shoot 50 arrows wrong. Yep. Make those first count. Now, when we're hunting, your first arrow is the only one that counts. You don't yep. get a second arrow. So, you know, I, when I, I've gone to some tournaments, say, well, you want any practice? No. I'm a hunter. I don't get yeah. a practice shot. I may draw my bow back with the arrow in it because I never draw a bow back without an arrow. Um, draw my bow back and let down just to make sure everything is there. Um, and, and, you know, my body is saying you can still pull it. Uh, <laughs> but, I, I don't I don't take practice rights. What happens if you take that practice shot and you get a perfect X? Now you just wasted a perfect shot. Because <laughs> maybe your next one you get off a little bit. Well, now you had that perfect X that you could have counted. Yep. Yep. You know. <laughs> yeah. And the I'm, the opposite. Take practice I'm the guy shots that's is... <laughs> I'm the guy that feels like I gotta go shoot a hundred arrows before I go shoot the tournament. And the tournament's <laughs> only 20 arrows long, but I had to go shoot 100 to make myself prepared. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like now, I said, it takes all shoot, kinds, right? Yeah, you do need to shoot enough as you're developing your skills. But once you get your skills down, yeah. um, you know, like I said, like you said, you know, you're not do perfect practice. You don't need lots of practice or lots of shooting to get perfect. You need lots of perfect practice to get perfect. Yep. And, and what I've heard before, the, what's the difference between an amateur and a professional? The amateur practices enough to get it right. The professional practice, practices enough that it can't get it wrong. 100%. That's why I'm still swinging from the amateur fence. I'll, <laughs> I'll, be, in the, I'll be in the semi-pro class till I can figure out how to not get it wrong, because right now I'm getting <laughs> a lot of it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but that's archery. That's that's yeah. part of, like you said, growing and learning and developing a skill. And, you know, it's uh, there's never an end goal. The end goal is, like you said, figuring out how to not get it wrong. But ninety nine point nine percent of us, we're always going to get something wrong along the way. And that's what keeps yeah. us from being perfect all the time. Yeah. Yeah. But, no, nobody's perfect. But, you know, hey, we strive to do the best we can. And. You know, I can say is like, did you do better than yesterday? Yep. Then you're improving. If you didn't, why didn't you? You know, yep. maybe your mind wasn't in it. And that's one of the things in archery. If your mind's not in it, don't even bother shooting because oh, if yeah. it's not in it, you're not going to do well. And I had one time I was, you know, after all the kids went to bed, I went down to the range, wanted to shoot. I shot five arrows. It's like, eh, it's just not, I'm just not feeling it. So uh, there's others down. I just talked to them a little bit and went home because I wasn't yep. feeling it. It's like, okay, all I'm going to do is develop bad habits because something's not working right. You know, I wanted to go down and shoot, but just when I got there, it just didn't feel right. Now, if I'd had a tournament the next day, I'd have probably had to 
regroup and you know practice but you know maybe all that would have done is make it worse you know so go home <laughs> yeah i uh, i asked uh, jesse broadwater one day i was in iowa and we were talking about practice and whatever and we were shooting on practice bills together and i said jesse how much do you actually practice and it floored me with his response and he said only what i need to said some days i shoot five arrows some days i shoot 500 it depends on what i'm working on but i set it myself a goal to work on something and whether it takes five arrows or 500 i'll work on that one thing until like you said i can't get it wrong and i feel like i've accomplished it but i'm also humble enough that he said if i get in 50 arrows in and i realize i'm doing it wrong and i'm not going to have a good day practicing i don't shoot 400 more to try to get it right i just quit come back to it after a while and, and start over and i think that's what's hard for most archers is we get in our head you know like my biggest pitfall is when i draw back my mind is I'm going to shoot this arrow and I'll go through my process. I'll go through everything that I want to do and know that it broke down and I need to stop. And instead I'll muscle through and complete shooting that arrow. And that was the wrong thing to do. And I did it wrong right. from the get go. I should have let down knowing that when my process broke down, when whatever it was that made my mind go, Oop, this isn't right at that point it should have been a let down and start over because if not to your point i'm just developed a bad habit because now even though it wasn't right i thought oh, i can still get through it it's not the case you need to just yeah. let down and start over same thing with a practice session like you said get five hours five arrows into it and know that something is wrong something doesn't feel right don't continue to sit there and beat yourself up about it walk away whether it's for 10 minutes or 10 hours come back to it later and figure it out then yeah, I, I know it's it's just one of those things you, you got to, you know, know what you can do and what you can't do. And uh, one yep. of the things when I first learned back catch and release, the guy said, once you're back, you're at full draw and you start the tension pulling back, you know, you're going to physically start the pull, aim, aim, aim. And he says, if it don't go off within three to five seconds, let down, start over because something's wrong. So if you're pulling, pulling, it's not going off, let down and do it again. And yep. you know, once once you get that in there, it's like, okay, pull and pull and pull and pull. Oh, this is taking too long. Let down, go through the motion yep. again. And even on a time tournament, you have time to draw and let down oh, yeah. probably two or three yeah. times. You know, if you draw back go through your process and, and you draw back, you're only spending three, three to five seconds. And if it's not working, you know, you go through your process. What how long does it take to do your process? Yep. You know, that's what you need to know. Okay. I, my process takes me six seconds from the time I start drawing till I get there. Or, you know, like I, I like to use one of those little slings to put the lower limb in. You know, I put on my rig so that I, once I start hunting with those, I figured, how did I ever hunt without one? You know, one of those <laughs> things. Because it's so much nicer to sit it in there and just rest the bow on that sling yeah. in your hand instead of sitting there trying to hold it. And yep. So well, one of my coaches that. told me in the very beginning, um, you know, talking about that, holding your bow up or holding it full draw for very long. If you want to know what your body's capable of, take your forearm, make a fist and flex your forearm. And, and when you do that, some people most of the time are in that five to seven second range and then your hands start shaking. Well, that's the lactic acid building up in your muscles. So it's the right. same difference in holding the bow up, holding it long, you know, full draw. There's not very many people like, you know, Chance Bobef of all people holds for like 14, 15 seconds or sometimes some of them are up to 20. They've showed him online doing it at like Vegas. You know, it's not many people that can hold a bow at full draw that long and still accurately complete a shot process because your body at some point starts to break down. Muscle fatigue sets in and. You know, people got to realize what that is and, and figure out that shot timing because archery's a lot of timing, repeatability, and it's learning what that is for you. And that really can't be taught. That has to be figured out. Right. And, and you got to relax. You know, you, you yep. have to put tension on your muscle, but you can't be tensed up. And and one of the things that, you know, we teach in martial arts is, you know, you, when, you, when you're doing a punch, your hands all relax until the last minute. So you know, those that are listening and watching, 
And just, and just imagine, keep your hand relaxed and see how fast you can make that hand move. Now make a tight fist, tight as you can, see how fast you can make that hand move. Not very fast and it, it wears you out. So that's the same thing in archery. If you're, you're tense trying to do this, you're gonna wear yourself out. Just relax, you know? Yep. And, and once, once you relax, you can hold a lot longer. Uh, you know, for us hunters, sometimes we have to hold lo longer than the three to five seconds, but we're not starting our shot process yet. We're just at full draw holding, waiting to start it because the animal's not in the spot we can shoot yet. You know, walking behind yep. a tree, we got to come to full draw before it walks out. But once it walks out, now then, when it's ready to shoot, we aim, you start our motion and aim and go through. And it still should take that same three to five seconds because that's our shot process. But we may have had to hold it full draw before we started the last piece of it. And, yeah. you know, you, you just got to just spend time having fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, and, and that's it. I mean, whether it's hunting or target archery or just flinging arrows in the backyard, whatever it may be, like figure out how to have fun with it. Sometimes we make it too complicated. We make it too stressful. You know, archery is meant to be another release, a way to have fun and enjoy something. And, you know, we got to make sure we don't take that part out of it. Yeah. I, I know uh, last year I, I created a little, a uh, little, uh, um, a little shorter, a TikTok video or something. I stuck a dandelion on my target, and I'm shooting at the dandelion. <laughs> I mean, <they're, laughs> that's why we do like you know so much with kids. Like we'll put balloons out there or put um, you know water balloons, something different. I mean, I've, we've shot what ping pong balls off of those little air canister things. I mean, yeah, just... you know, those are kind of those are a challenge because oh, they're bouncing yeah, up they and are. down all the time. Yeah, or you know that. Uh, like they do with the recurves where they shoot skeet and throw those foam discs in there. I mean, there's so many ways to do archery and have fun. It's not just hunting. It's not just shooting a specific set target. It's just, you know, go outside and have fun. I know people that take flu flu arrows and recurves and go out and just shoot to shoot, shoot at anything just to have fun yeah. doing it. Well, you was talking about the aerial one. Uh, this last summer, I went and helped out at the Nebraska Outdoor Expo. And they had what they called aerial archery, which they had those discs and the thing shoots them off and then they yep. shoot them with their, the arrows. And um, that was kind of fun. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Now they've got uh, almost like laser tag, but it's archery tag. And you put on like a paintball helmet and uh, uh, chest gear or whatever else. And you actually run around and they're like super lightweight, they're like five pound draw. And they shoot an arrow with a big foam ball in the end. And you actually just like playing paintball with bows, but you run around and chase each other and shoot each other with recurves. I mean, they've just <laughs> they've expanded archery into all this, you know, carefree, fun-loving way to do it. Now, obviously, I don't recommend doing something like that unless it's set up correctly. But, you know, there's right. just so much you can do with archery that, uh, you know, whether it's alone or with a team or hunting or, you know, target side whatever there's just there's so much to it just have fun with it well and they have different face targets they got tic-tac-toe targets which is kind of fun to play you know you oh, have yeah. normal tic-tac-toe you have five arrows you gotta get three in a row and, and and the fun part is is okay if you do get three in a row and you want to take one of them away you just have to get closer to the center whoever's close to the center gets that spot so you have to yep. play a little strategy because you got five arrows so if you want to take one away that's one less you get get make yours. So uh, yep. that's kind of a fun one. They also have uh, darts, like you know, like yep. with throwing darts. They have big faces that you can play darts with your bow and arrow on there. Uh, they have some with the decks of cards on them, so you can play cards. Um, yep. uh, and there's, I'm drawing a blank. There's a couple more that I actually have those targets. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I used to play a, a, in a darts league. When I was in college, we had an archery shop close by, and um, that was one of the things that we did is we actually had a dart league. We shot three spot one night a week. We shot five spot another night a week, and then we actually all got together and shot darts. And it's a lot of fun. I mean, you really think, oh, it's, you know, like people say shooting a three spot. All you got to do is put it in there every time. That's not hard to do. Yeah, think about shooting your bow and then try to go play dart league with somebody and shoot that little <laughs> bitty red line 
you know, and, and play darts. It's it's a lot of fun, and it's a lot harder even at 20 yards than people think it would be. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just all just having fun. And, and you know, there's a lot of smaller paper animal targets, and uh, oh, so yeah. you can shoot different animals and, you know, just, you know, get some target and put them up there and yep. shoot at them. That's, that's the that's the fun part is there's so many things you can do with it. Oh yeah. Get your buddies together, take your hunting bows out and go find a techno hunt somewhere and shoot the live screen animals running around, whether it's elk or Buffalo or goats or whatever. I mean, there's just so much to it. Yeah. Those that don't know what that is, that's a video screen. It shows that has a, a video playing of different animals, different situations. And you take your bow and your arrows, change the tip to a mushroom tip, and then it knows where you hit, and then it scores it. Kind of fun to do. It's a lot of fun. We used to do that for uh, bow season tune-ups. We'd get a group of guys together and go find a techno hunt somewhere. And, you know, it wasn't too expensive to sit in there for a couple hours a day and shoot animals that you may not get to hunt this year, but yeah, still get to go enjoy it. So get you used to picking a spot on the animal instead of just shooting at a spot that's right that's right and that's you know it, it's kind of hard to do us as 3d archers we are spoiled a little bit because we get to shoot all these foam animals but you know i think about a lot of guys that go hunting that um, and gals that just you know shoot some type of a foam target every day that has dots on it but then when it comes time to go in to hunt that animal you know, they're not used to picking that spot behind the shoulder or what the anatomy of that animal is. And it's like, you know, you know, if you've got that block target, that's a great way, um, you know, go buy some 2D paper faces that are just the outlines or a picture of that animal to get used to, you know, where to shoot for the longest time. You know, I, I would have mistakenly shot turkeys wrong because I didn't understand truly when I was younger, the anatomy of a turkey. and where you would actually want to shoot that animal but you know you could go buy that 2d paper target that actually shows you where to hit it and then you know you get better at picking that spot on a live animal so well and then too you know like you do the 3d shoots and like you're shooting at a deer target you know where the uh eight ring and 10 ring and 12 rings are at isn't necessarily where you're going to shoot it no because uh you know, that's the scoring ring. And if you're shooting down at one, you're still going to shoot for that scoring ring. That may not be where you want. If on the ground, you're going to shoot the real animal differently. So, you know, it's good to be able to pick a spot, but you need to know in a real situation, you know, yeah. where would you actually aim? And, and those those targets are kind of nice because, you know, I always tell, tell people to look at the exit. Where do you want the yeah. arrow to exit? Not the entrance, look at the exit. Because yep. that's that's going to tell you, you know, if you're shooting at such a steep angle that the arrow comes out the bottom, you're not going to have a blood trail for a long time. Right. Because it's all plugged up. Um, if you're shooting up, you don't want to shoot high on them because you're not going to have a blood trail. <laughs> so, you know, you well, just, and that's that's just that's experience a part getting of, out there. Yeah. And that's. That uh, is interesting because this buck that I killed last year in Kansas, you know, a lot of people don't think about that exit hole or they don't think about the angle that they're at. And that's where target archery for me has helped me be a more proficient hunter. Um, The animal that I shot out in Kansas was at four and a half yards. I was 22 feet in the air, but the angle that I was at if I would have tried to shoot that animal with a 20 yard pin I would have either missed or possibly wounded that that animal um because of the steep angle I was at like a 52 degree angle to be able to shoot that animal well I had to shoot him in almost like 45 or 46 yards to get the proper trajectory because he was so close and I've had conversations with guys about that and they just it's mind blowing to think, well, my range finder says whatever. And it's like, well, the most range finders tap out, you know, at that 30 or 35 degree angle. So unless you've played with a lot of the angle compensation, um, it's hard to know that. And target archery for me has helped me understand that. And fortunately, um, I was lucky enough that when I was sitting in that tree, looking down 
had a trail that came right by me. I ranged that trail. My range finder kept saying like seven and a half, eight yards. And I thought, man, that doesn't look that far from the tree. So I took it off angle compensation and ranged it. And sure enough, it was four and a half yards, but it was at a 52 degree angle. And I have a app on my phone for target archery. And I plugged in those exact, you know, situations for the bow that I had. And it told me flat out, it was like 47 or 48 yards is what I needed to dial my uh, sight to, to get the proper angle compensation. And, you know, that's the crazy part about archery that, you know, maybe gets overlooked. Like we talked about earlier with differences in form or, or equipment or whatever else it's knowing that angle, knowing the exit of where that arrow needs to come out to cleanly harvest that animal. And, you know, that's stuff that I challenge people, you know, when we talk about archery is, you know, learning that, learning to understand from a hunting situation, how much angles and height that you're up in a tree make a difference. Yeah, well, the, the way I like to explain that is, you know, all carpenters know what a three, four, five triangle is. Yep. You know, because they do it all the time. That gives you a right angle. So what that is, is one leg is three, the other leg is four, and the angle between the two is, is five. So what I like to tell people is, like, okay, you have a trail that is 30 feet away from your tree stand, straight out. But you're 40 feet up in a tree. Now, you're straight angle, you know, without angle compensation, you, you're going to range it and you're going to say it's 50 yards. What do you shoot it for? And, and a lot of us say, well, 50. No, you just shot over its back by yeah. long ways. You got to shoot it for 30. Because the reason for that is gravity works horizontally. So how far are you traveling horizontal is all the arrow cares about. That's what you shoot it for. So I take, I had one where the, the, ring, the trail was 20 yards away, but I'm at the top of a hill on top of a tree. So I'm probably, oh, geez, good, like 40, 50 feet up from where the trail is. And yep. so what I do is I, I take the trail, look up, so straight across, okay, I'm going to range that tree that's on that trail straight across. So it's 20 yards. It was 20 yard trail all day long. Here it comes walking down there. Now, if you use one of those to go by the size of the animal, it is said it's probably a 50 yard shot or better. I yep. shot it for 20 because I knew that trail is 20 yards away and I got it. You know, it stuck there right where it's supposed to go. And I killed the deer because I shot it for 20, not what it looked like. And yep. it's, it's one of those things that just like, I know that this is a 20 yard trail. I've, I've looked at it and I've estimated this before, that was even before I had range finder. You know, you just get used to judging the distances, oh, you know, yeah. which is a disadvantage of having a range finder is you don't learn how to do it without one. Um, but that's the thing you had to look at. And the other thing to remember <laughs> on shooting those real close ones is where the arrow is, the arrow is generally by your lips and your hand out there. Now, where's your, where's your eye and your sights? It's up the distance between the corner of your mouth and your eyes. You know what? Probably, you know, four inches or so. Yep. Um, so now the arrow is four inches below your sights. So when you shoot close range, um, take, you know, for those that want to try it, uh, go just out, you know, five feet away from you, draw a circle and aim at that circle and see your arrow hits. It's going to hit four inches low or whatever the distance between, between your eyes and the sight and the, and, and yep. the arrow. So now at close range, you're low. You're shooting low. So at, at some point, they're going to get, you know, meat. So I had, I was on a platform and there was a gator five feet from the platform. And I knew because I had one of those sight tapes on, on there that I figured out. It's like, okay, at five feet, I need to shoot my 70 yard pin. And because we're raised up, your form, a lot of people do the form, they just drop their arm. That's not your form. So you draw up, standing up straight, bend at the hips until you get, the, so I'm leaning against the rail, bending down, bending down. And when my pin that I knew was supposed to be there, uh, my 70 yard pin hit it, I, I stopped. And then I started drawing, I shot, my went through my shot process, I shot, stuck it right where it's supposed to be. And of course I'm leaning over so far, I had trouble standing back up, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. and, and somebody would say, well, I just sight down the arrow. Have you ever shot that way? Oh, no, I just sight down the arrow. 
<laughs> yeah. If, if you don't practice that, how are you going to know? So that's yep. that's something you got to think of the close shots. And I've been on, on ranges where they purposely set a target in the five to 10 feet range. Yep. Knowing that people are going to miss it. This is easy. Put 20 yard pin and go. No, they'd shoot low every time and, yep. and miss it. And either get a five because they just hit the bottom of it or a zero. And you know, that purposely because of that close range shot. And yep. I, I, I do that I, out of Reading at like three feet, I think it is. And you know, there's uh, all the pros get it because everybody's done it long enough and watched other people and talk about it and spend the time. But understanding those cut charts to know how much you need to come down based on feed. I mean, that's it's uh, like I said, that's what helped me harvest that deer in Kansas is having that target background because I never would have done it. I never, I mean, how many people honestly think about, oh, I need to go up to a target at five feet and figure out how my bow shoots, let alone then put a 20 foot angle or, you know, a 10 foot angle, yeah. whatever you are up in a tree into consideration with it. And, you know, there's a lot to this that you know, it goes back to, like you said, constantly learning and, and developing your skills and figuring out more about what you can do is, you know, for those listening or get to see this, go, go play with those short shots, go play with those way under 20 yard shots and figure out that, you better be looking at a 30 and a 40 or a 50 yard pin or else chances of hitting what you're trying to harvest is you're going to miss. <laughs> yeah, I know. When I was, I was doing some of my videos, I was creating it down in my basement. I don't have much room in my basement. So my target was probably, oh, 10 feet away. Yeah. And I've got a, um, it's an old 1870s house. So the basement is just a bunch of bricks and there's a ledge up there. Well, the ledge is a little too high, but I set my target up there. So I'm practicing. Like, okay. So I'm doing the video. It's like, okay, I'm to make sure I don't stick this arrow into the brick. So I had to make sure that, you know, I'm aiming up high enough on there and, 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 you know, not go too high, you know, make sure I'm doing it so I can, you know, show how to do different stuff. And, you know, cause I don't want to stick my arrow in there because that would not be fun to have an arrow come flying back at you. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, because hey, I hit a concrete block. <laughs> yeah, not that yeah. I I have I don't have plenty of arrows, but I I hate wasting one if I don't need to. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I, I'm cheap. I have arrows. They work. I don't want to buy any more. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it doesn't get any cheaper. Let's just keep what we got and make the most efficient use of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we've been talking for quite a while here now, so. <laughs> We should probably let you go, finish your day. and. Well, I appreciate the time. I appreciate you having me on and look forward to talking again soon. Yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun. I enjoy talking with you, um, obviously, because we've talked for a couple hours anyway. <laughs> so, yeah I, yeah, I think we probably, yeah, it's been a good right couple hours, hours plus. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So... Yeah, it's it's been real great having you on here, and uh, we'll be talking to you later. I'm sure of that, and uh, you know we'll we'll chat in the group too, and and we'll just uh, um, help anybody out that has any questions. Yeah. And once again, thanks for being on the show. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah. My name is Roy Canterbury, and I've been your host today on Arch Talk One Hundred and One.